Is there any appetite for a Saturday meeting so we could spend? I'm interested, but you know, my husband will come in where we could spend like two hours in the morning, take a break, come back, three hours in the afternoon. Hey, Roger, can you hear me? Oh, ow. What I don't want to do is just start passing stuff with a lot of things, a lot of conditions, because we want to yeah. get it, get it through. And that, that starts getting... Do you want me to try? There has the potential to get... Roger? Sure. Yes. Um, okay, I just wanted to see you say so, something. Um, I, I don't think it's a terrible... I just want to see if we could hear you. Just, we gotta make sure is, this, is this Angela speaking? Yes, it is. We need to make sure <laughs> that we've got a... I'm... <laughs> Roger, can you hear me? I, I can. Okay. Like Very good. Right. We're, we're good. Thank you. Whenever you want. You Not can necessarily start. even taking anything so, new, just clearing out what we've got. Yeah. I know Rick Duperry did say he was. We're waiting on one member. So, whether or not that happens. Yeah, well, that always depends on whether CMP calls them up and says, oh, by the way, could you get out and drive to Augusta? Exactly. <laughs> so we're waiting on uh, Rick Duperry? Yeah. Okay. Oh, it's already 6.32, isn't it? Let me know when you're ready to go, okay? Will do. Yeah, we're, we'll be a little delayed, I think, just until we get a fourth member. Do you have Rick DuPerry's uh, phone number? Yeah, I do. Can you tell me what it is? No. <laughs> it's private info. You can just FOIA that. <laughs> Rick DuPerry. Who's, who's missing? Uh, Rick DuPerry. Can you hear me? I probably got to Maybe ask to see if he can see on me. Hey Jay, can you hear me? We can hear you, Rick. Hey Jamal. Oh. All right. Hey, I've been on the phone for a while, but no one could hear me. So I think I'm good now. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Roger, can you Thank hear you. us? 
Yes. All right, there we go. All right, we're working through a quick technical situation. We're gonna be starting this meeting in a minute or two. I'm gonna go on live on YouTube. Okay. Thank you. I'm gonna watch the door until Ken gets here to unlock it, then I'll join downstairs. If I'm needed, I'll pop in, but otherwise, I can't remember what we had worked out, Angela, but I'll have to do the production side for now. You don't remember. I'm sorry. I have it right now. <laughs> I should have saved it. be a good test. I keep telling my kids, it's not a big deal to wear a mask all day at school. <laughs> <laughs> right? You're surprised. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is a good test. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I'm glad I don't have the glasses. On and then oh, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if any of you watch football, but the Kansas City oh. Chiefs head coach. Yes. My goodness. That was yes. a that was, was there. That was awful. <laughs> On the inside. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, so we're we're live. We are okay, uh, Jamel. I'm going to ask that when we have uh, applicants up, since you've got the screen in front of you, and I might have trouble reading some of the names, just let me know who's in the room for the applicant. Sure. Okay. Thanks. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna bang my hand as a gavel. I'm gonna call this meeting to order. Uh, Tonight is the uh, Monday, September 14th, 2020, Town of Scarborough Planning Board meeting. Thank you for all attending. It's nice to see people in person again. Uh, first order of business is the Pledge of Allegiance. If you could please rise and join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. And we will do the roll call. Rachel Hendrickson. Here. Robin Saunders. Roger Bealey. Here. Mike King. Rick Duperry. Here. Jennifer Ladd. Nicholas McGee. Here. We have uh, with Rick Mike King as our first alternate, and we are missing a couple board members this evening. We do have four, we do have a quorum. So Roger, Rachel, myself, and Rick Duperry are the voting members for the evening. Next order of business is the approval of minutes for July 13th, August 3rd, and August 24th. Do we have any discussion around these items? I'll accept a motion to approve. So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. I have Rick Perry as a second. All in favor? So uh, Roger Bealey is a yes. Rick Perry. Yes. R Rachel Hendrickson? Yes. Nicholas McGee is yes. We share that as unanimous. Thank you. Next item on tonight's agenda is MRW Development LLC requests a site plan review for lot six within the Innovation District Assessor's Map U53 lot six. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so this project is before you for a preliminary uh, subdivision review. Uh, it consists of approximately an 18,000 square foot warehouse and garage building and a nearly 7,700 7, square foot mixed-use two-story building consisting of warehouse and garage space on the first floor and eight apartment units on the second floor within lot six of the Innovation District subdivision. The project is located at the end of Dynamic Drive. Uh, the applicant was last before you all in July, um, and as noted in the staff memo, uh, staff from Maine DEP has indicated that they are requiring an amendment to the Innovation District Subdivision Stormwater Permit, given that the impervious area proposed is above the thresholds associated with the overall project. So the applicant should update the board on their communication with DEP in regards to this issue and the timing of their review, given the board does not grant final approval until outside, agents, outside agency approvals are in hand. As requested, the applicant is proposing uh, a new stone dust dust path along the western edge of the side, the lot and lot 29 to the south. Uh, the path is not located on property controlled by the applicant, and staff would like to ensure that this path is con constructed as part of this project. The applicants provided additional information in response to prior comments related to appropriate buffering and separation 
between the project and the lot to the south, lot 29, which is the Throttle Car Club. Uh, so the applicant should discuss this, this comment with the board. And staff would also like to note that the applicant is proposing to transfer the vehicle trips uh, for this project uh, from the approved main DOT uh, traffic movement permit to another application within the subdivision that's actually on your agenda later tonight. So therefore, final approval uh, will not be granted until the required interim traffic study has been reviewed and approved by the board. At this point, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jamel. Thank you, Jamel. A couple quick housekeeping notes. Item number 15 has been tabled at the request of the applicant. That's Oyster Development, LLC. Um, we do uh, take hearings up until 10 o'clock this evening. Uh, we have a very busy agenda, so we're going to ask all applicants uh, to try to make their uh, presentations to us as succinct as they can, and hopefully we can get through this. Thank you. Uh, Dan Bacon. Uh, good evening. Uh, can, I, can the board hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Jamel, for the introduction. Obviously, Dan Bacon with m &R Holdings here on behalf of MRW. Um, and I'm going to provide a quick introduction. Uh, Nancy St. Clair is going to provide an update on the site plan, and then we want to entertain board uh, questions. Uh, I first quickly wanted to start in terms of where we're at with the Innovation District. Um, I don't know if the board's been out there, um, but it's really kind of coming together. This is a shot of uh, the intersection of Center Street and Innovation Way. Um, the pavilion, the placemaking elements that have been installed. Uh, Score Builders is open on the corner uh, for business. On the other side of the street, AV Technic is in. So we're excited about um, where the district is at and have really designed um, lot six and seven, which is next on your agenda, to, to really complement what's, what's going on out there and to, to plug into uh, the sidewalk system and in, in the layout and the character of the, of the district. So this graphic um, shows what's happening on Dynamic, Dynamic Drive um, and lot six, it's not labeled um, as such, but the barn and the in-cube um, buildings are, are lot six. And then lot seven is across Dynamic Drive just to the right, uh, which we'll talk about next. Um, the last time we presented to the board, uh, back in July, there's a fair amount of conversation around um, pedestrian connection to Innovation Way uh, and the sidewalk system that exists there. Um, so we went back to the drawing board and um, have added uh, an exclusive pedestrian walkway or stone dust path that's going to connect all of Lot 6. If you can see my hand on the screen, um, along this alignment, which is in orange. Um, it's going to tie that site into the sidewalk that exists on Innovation Way, connect to the plaza, connect to the other elements um, within the project, and also provide a nice connection for the entire project um, from Innovation Way to the, to the trail system. Um, so that was talked about a fair amount. Um, we've added that component. There's still going to be the uh, shared bike ped um facility along dynamic drive like there's been planned so there's multiple uh, options for pedestrians that we think improve the project and address that that concern um in addition we just thought this plan would be helpful too to show the, the larger context uh, to the north of lot six is a large open space area um where the trail system is, it's all forested and, and wetlands and ties into Warren Woods, if as board members likely remember from the subdivision process. So that's all wooded up in there. Um, and, um, you know, it is where the trail system is. And um, we felt like that's a great buffer to any adjacent uses and doesn't need additional uh, buffering along that edge. Um, the stormwater pond is is obviously to the left. Um, there's some nice views from lot six of the pond. Um, and so that's our, I think that's a nice setting for residents and for end users in, in the incubator spaces. I'm going to jump quickly to this next image. Um, it zooms in a little bit further and really highlights how uh, the, the lots along Dynamic Drive, and also later on your agenda, um, the ID self-storage facility 
are really being designed um, to complement each other uh, in terms of access and, and layout, um, but also particularly kind of landscaping and uh, buffering between sites. And so Nick Aceto um, might be on the call right now. I'm not sure if he is or not, um, but he's been designing and involved in each of these sites um, from Throttle, uh, which the board saw uh, a few months ago, and that in, in terms of landscaping uh, on the Throttle site, we provided uh, with Nick's uh, design a tree buffer between Throttle um, and Lot 6. And um, so we're, we're not adding landscaping there. Uh, Throttle is providing that landscaping, but we're complementing it uh, around the Lot 6 uh, B building and also around um, the, the building A. Since the July meeting, uh, we added some additional landscaping with some additional um, Princeton Elms and then some service berry um, along Dynamic Drive, which are the plantings that are also um, going to be installed and were approved for throttle. So there's kind of symmetry in terms of the plantings being used um, and spacing along Dynamic Drive. And uh, in addition to this, on, on this plan, um, it calls out a bit, a bit more clearly the proposed uh, stone dust path that I mentioned earlier, shown here in gray. Um, with a connection from building both building B and uh, building A to that pathway. Uh, it also shows um, that arrows denoting, you know, a, a path that would connect to the trail system um, that's already uh, in place in the subdivision. So I think with that, I'm going to have Nancy um, just update you a little bit on uh, the, the changes to our site plan. Um, and uh, the stormwater um, process we see kind of moving forward from preliminary to final. Um, um, and I guess a final comment, um, MRW team acknowledges uh, the comment that uh, Jamel made around the traffic permitting um, and will work with the board. Uh, Crossroads will be working with the board between now and final on that interim traffic study and that's well underway uh, at this time. Well, thank you, Dan. Um, as Dan just uh, changed the slide here, this is sort of a, a further zoomed in view, looking particularly at lot six and the two buildings proposed uh, on lot six. Uh, so as Dan mentioned, we have been before you folks back in July. Uh, and in the interim since that last presentation and now, uh, we've had the opportunity to actually address uh, two rounds of staff review comments. So things have sort of boiled down to a few uh, last items that we'd like to talk to you about uh, tonight uh, in support of seeking uh, preliminary subdivision approval for this site. So uh, as you remember from our prior presentations, building A is about an 18,000 square foot building. It has uh, access uh, to uh, incubator spaces on either side, on the east side and the west side of the building. Uh, and then on building B, we have access to uh, four first floor incubator spaces on the north side of the building. And then on the south side, we have parking and access associated with the proposed uh, eight apartment units that are on the second floor of building B. So uh, as Dan mentioned, we do have a couple of items we, we did want to talk to you folks uh, about tonight. And they're basically associated with sort of the last round of comments that we received uh, from staff, uh, the first of which is the discussion with regard to the 85% lot coverage versus 80% lot coverage. Uh, as you recall from our application materials, we had proposed uh, lot coverage that was in excess of 80%, uh, but that was uh, below 85%. So under those provisions under the local approvals, uh, the requirement was that we provide on-site treatment for that additional uh, impervious cover on the lot, which we did uh, with the installation or the design for installation of a bioretention cell on the south side of building A. So we, uh, as part of our review with the staff, we went through the, the uh, design process for that to design that to, to comply with the chapter 500 standards at DEP uh, for that BMP. When we uh, were 
uh, alerted to the fact that the DEP permit would require modification. Uh, that was something that actually came uh, as news to us. We thought that that was already covered uh, in the existing site location approval for the innovation district. So um, the developer is working with the DEP uh, in order to follow up on that and find out what sort of uh, permit requirements would be necessary uh, to address that. So that is something that we will be working on uh, with the DEP in the interim between now and seeking final approval. Um, but it is something that at the local level we had already designed and provided for you folks uh, as part of our application materials. The um, <clears throat> stone dust path was another item that uh, was discussed Dan mentioned it and showed you folks where it was going to be uh, on the site. And I believe in the last comments um, that we received, there was just an indication that that path would need to be constructed in association with the approval of lot six. It would actually be constructed by crossroads, but it would be done uh, in association with this lot. And we certainly understand that. Uh, the last item was <clears throat> with regard to plantings and bufferings in concert with uh, the landscaping on the abutting properties, et cetera. And I think the graphic that Dan had on the presentation uh, slide before you really sort of highlights how this site uh, has been designed in, in order to integrate in with all the designs uh, for the lots that have been developed thus far on Dynamic Drive. Uh, <clears throat> so as Dan mentioned, on the southerly side of lot six, we do have uh, plantings that are associated with the throttle site on that common line, but we've carried that design over to uh, the trees that are in front of lot six, building B. Uh, that's the residential piece. So that's pretty heavily landscaped uh, in that area there. As we go further along uh, the site to the north, uh, we've added a couple of uh, Amelanchiers along the side of the building, which is a shrub that's consistent in the same family with the shrubs that are proposed along the uh, east side of the throttle building along Dynamic Drive. We've also added, um, there's been four additional shrubs in the same family uh, along the south side of building A and two more in that same family along the north side of building A. So we have added uh, a few rounds of landscaping in response to, <clears throat> excuse me, comments that we received from staff thus far. We're confident that with that in the sort of the graphic that we've shown you here, how things all kind of tie together, we're confident that that would uh, satisfy the buffering uh, requirements associated with this particular site. Uh, the last item that I really wanted to touch on is just for the record, we do have three waiver requests uh, before you folks. Uh, they deal with the minimum separation distance between the two driveways, uh, the one that is to the south of the site, if you will, uh, on the south side of building B, and the driveway that comes in between, <coughs> excuse me, building A and B uh, on the site. We also have <coughs> a request to reduce the uh, driveway opening width for a commercial driveway. Uh, down to 24 feet to be consistent with our proposed reduction, the third waiver we're, we're requesting, reduction of a drive aisle width to 24 feet versus 25 feet as, as an effort to reduce impervious cover on the lot. And on the south side of building B on that residential section, that waiver request for a drive aisle is actually down to 20 feet. Uh, so those are our waiver requests. Uh, we certainly would like to talk to you folks more about any questions that you may have on those. But um, the last items that I'd like to show you are actually the last couple of slides in our presentation. <clears throat> uh, Dan, if you want to skip forward, there we go. <clears throat> Excuse me, this is uh, ALA's rendered elevation of the uh, Incube building. So this is the 18,000 square foot building uh, with the proposed siding colors and the contrasting features uh, along that. You can see the fenestration, you can see the overhead doors, uh, and you can also see we've got provisions for uh, portable planters <clears throat> along the faces of the building. This face is the east view, if you will. Um, the west view is identical. And, <clears throat> excuse me, you can see on the south uh, side of this rendering there are windows. Uh, and that is proposed also on the north side of the building as well. Uh, the next slide, Dan. 
This is uh, the uh, combination building, the uh, residential on the upper story and the four incubator spaces on the lower story. The <clears throat> view that's on the top of the screen is actually the north face of the building where the overhead doors would be to access the uh, incubator spaces and the windows on the second floor are the residential units. On <clears throat> the what would be the lower left corner of your screen, you can see the rendered image of the building as you approach it coming from dynamic drive. So the view that you see uh, in that image is the south face where the residential access would be. And the east face of the building is shown in that rendered image as well as the next uh, view which shows the uh, residential piece of it, the sort of the prominent face on that. So with that, uh, I would certainly like to turn it over to you folks for any questions or comments that you may have. And we would like uh, to respectfully request that we uh, do receive a uh, preliminary approval tonight, recognizing that we do have a few items necessary to go um, before final. So with that, uh, we'll take any questions you might have. Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> At this time, we do have opportunity for public comment. If you would like to speak, please use the raise my hand feature in the bottom right hand corner of your Zoom mm -hmm. meeting and raise your hand. I'll give you a minute to locate that. For those of you at home, we do not have any members of the public in the audience this evening. So, any Anything there? No, nobody there. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to close public comment, turn it over to the board. Rachel, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, First of all, I, I do I do appreciate the landscaping that that's there. I think uh, seeing the whole of the the concept, how it all fits together, is very helpful. I do have a question about the landscaping. I, it, all of the trees that you showed um, are they part of uh, lot seven down through AV Technic, or are, are those is that landscaping going to be put in? for anybody who buys the lots next to AV Technic and up past um, lot seven. I'm just trying to figure out who, who has the responsibility there for the planting. So the landscaping that is shown on this composite plan is a combination of plantings that have been previously approved by the site plan review process. So all of the plantings that are on the throttle site are ones that have been approved by you folks. Uh, similarly, with AV Technic, the plantings that are at the uh, south side of Lot 7 are proposed as part of our application materials uh, in this location, as is shown there. And then all of the plantings that are on Lot 6 are associated uh, with Lot 6. Uh, so anything that's around the building on Lot 7 is on Lot 7, but will be uh, constructed as part of the construction on that particular lot. The trees that are shown on the edge of lot 12 uh, beside those yellow boxes are based on a landscaping plan that's for another project that's for before you folks on the agenda tonight. Uh, so those all of the uh, plantings that are shown on here are part of proposed or approved site plans before you. All right, thank, thank you. That, that's helpful. Um, I, I have an observation about the uh, stone dust trail. Um, I, I'm not clear how somebody, how a resident of the building, of um, building B, is going to get on the trail. Are they going to walk through the plantings or is there going to actually be uh, a clear connection? No, um, there is a sidewalk along the south face of building B that will connect directly to that trail. Right where that cursor is is where that connection is. Okay, that's, again, thank you. And that gray line up of, uh, right along, and now swoop to the right. Uh, that is, uh, the, the gray line, I can't read it. That's why I'm just kind of pointing. Um, <laughs> is that going to be marked as access to the trail? Is that going to be marked on the, uh, on the asphalt? Um, the, if you're 
if you're looking at the plan right where Dan has his cursor. No, I mean, look, are... have Dan drop, no, have Dan go back up <laughs> right there. Okay, and then there's, you can see there's a, a, a large gray line. Is, um, that, that... is that the proposed access to the trail for anybody who might be walking up the sidewalk? Uh, the, just a little bit higher, that line is actually a phase line that you see on the plan. But right where Dan had his cursor, right there, is a striped walkway that directly connects to that trail. Okay, so how so people coming up the sidewalk past building B mm -hmm. and turning left to go towards the trail, are they just going to be walking through the parking area or is there going to be some sort of a striped indicator that says, if you want to get to the trail, go this way? There's going to be a, a trail connection right where you see that black arrow and it says to trail. That's where it's going to change from stone dust to the, the trail material. Um, it's more of an organic, you know, wood chip type material um, towards the pond. So that's the transition. And there isn't any impervious area from the stone dust path and to that trail connection. That's where it's it's um, grass and, and wildflowers in that area. So it's... Uh, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm actually getting a little more basic than that or a little more oh. simplistic than that. And that is somebody is walking up the sidewalk from Throttle Club. Dynamic Drive. On Dynamic Drive. Oh. And they get past okay. Building B and they say, there's a trail over there. Is there going to be some sort of striping to point them oh, to yeah. the trail, or are they just going to be cutting across the parking lot willy-nilly? So there's, um, if you can see, there's some dashed lines, some striping just where my hand is, if, you, if it's showing up in your screen, <laughs> yep. below the, um, the, the buffer from Building A. That is a uh, striped area to direct pedestrians and bikers. That ties into Dynamic Drive. It also ties into the crosswalk from Lot 7 over to Building A. So there's going to be striping there for pedestrians to get over to the trail system. All right. Th thank you. That was, that was the question. Um, okay. I, couldn't, I couldn't see it from here. Um, all right. I, uh, that's about it. I, I recognize that you've done more work in terms of um, the the buildings in terms of providing some interest with the plantings out there. I, I still have concerns about black buildings on black asphalt, or if it's a gray building, sooner or later the asphalt turns gray and you get a gray building on gray asphalt. And it, it creates an, a, an atmosphere of a great deal of bulk. I, I think you've you've worked to mitigate that, um, but I, I do I do believe that uh, it is going to be a very large and blocky sort of building. Um, it's a back lot, so uh, that's, that's allowable, but I, I would hope that the people start to think about a little bit more about the, the visuals on some of these large buildings. Uh, and I understand warehouses or incubators are, are warehouses, and there's not a lot of difference that you can do with them. But um, some creativity, I think, would be uh, appropriate in this case. So thank you. Thank you, Rachel. I have a follow-up question on the stone dust path real quick. Um, <clears throat> are you or you or whoever's going to be there, is there any maintenance plan on that for the winter? <clears throat> is there a plan to keep we're, that clear? Um, we're likely to clear in the winter. That, that's something we're talking internally about. Um, so yes, certainly dynamic drive is going to be clear in the winter as well, which is the other kind of bike ped area. Um, I think my concern would be on uh, the front of lot six building B, uh, snow storage. It looks to me if I was plowing that, I'm probably heading yeah. straight in and probably burying that path. That, is there I, this up. I shouldn't have switched. So this area here, if yeah. you can see my hand. I'm worried yeah. that that will get plowed in if your intent is to try to keep it open during the winter. Yeah. Food for thought. How's uh, that? We'll look at between now and final. We'll figure out a, a snow maintenance plan that that prevents that from happening. Thanks. All right. Sorry, uh, Roger. You want to have a crack at this? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I think you've done a nice job. Um, 
I just want to weigh in on the waivers. I have I have no problem with the waivers. Um, I and I think you've answered uh, all the questions pertaining to the path. Um, I do have a question, a clarification, probably from staff. Uh, well, I know it's from staff. Building A is is black. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. The question to staff is: I, I'm a little confused over a discussion we had at our last meeting at the workshop pertaining to the Mercedes dealership and the use of uh, black. I mean, I think I, first of all, let me clarify. I, I like, I like that. I think it looks nice, but I'm, I'm a little confused from my own point of view as to when black, that, that's the <coughs> primary color to me. Maybe Jay, you can clarify that for me because I'm sure there's something I don't understand. Yep, I'd be happy to. So um, just uh, a reminder, and I think we talked about this the last time this before the board, the design standards don't apply in the innovation district for certain uses, this being the type of use. So um, okay. <laughs> that, that, that restriction and that what we were talking about with when, during that joint public hearing with the council had to do with that project is required to meet the, the design standards and it's in the design standards that talk about the primary color not being black. So again, design standards are not applicable to this building because this building doesn't uh, trigger them. So, so, so the this, if this was located anywhere else, it couldn't be black then basically is what you're saying. If it was in our other commercial districts other than the uh, industrial district um, or in the innovation district and it's one of those listed uses um, there's six or eight sort of listed uses that explicitly um, um, state that design standards uh, do not apply so correct okay yep. okay good thanks for clarifying that um, I think uh, I think it looks pretty nice um, I, I just have to comment uh, when I look at building B when I see it, I think of the Nonsuch Brewery <laughs> building or that to some degree. I don't know why, but but I think it looks good. So I'm uh, I'm satisfied with everything they've done. I'm all set. Thank you, Roger. Rick Duperry. Yeah, I just have a, a quick clarification question, and I may be the only one that's confused. Did they? Did you say there's residential above the? Incubation space? In yeah. building B, that's correct. So the, the building, if you can see the, the screen right now, Rick, um, there's a two-story building planned, uh, building B, that, that's on the screen. First floor is incubators, and second floor are uh, residential apartments. Um, and um, that's the intention with this building. Correct. OK. Um, you know, it's just a little bit different, um, and, I'm, and I'm sure that, you know, you obviously probably have to talk to to, to the fire folks. Um, I, I guess I haven't, I haven't quite seen that done a lot in the past. Um, and I was wondering, so is the downstairs all, I, I would assume a building of that size would have to require sprinklers anyway, but is there any, is there any special attention that you need to pay to something being in that incubator space that could potentially, I guess I'm, uh, my thought around safety and fire codes. So uh, I'm sure you're adhering to all the safety and fire codes, but was there anything special that you had to do that you could enlighten us or to have residential over incubation space? Sure. I mean, it's going to be a sprinkler building and there's um, fire separation requirements, fire rating requirements um, between uh, the spaces um, vertically and horizontally, but you're talking about horizontal between the first and second floor. Um, and um, the town's fire department and the fire marshal are still going to be looking at the, the design specifics um, prior to issuance of the building permit to um, you know, ensure it meets all fire codes. But our team's been working on it so far and, and has it designed to meet the life safety requirements. Rick, if I could also jump in there just to kind of a little bit of sort of back information as well. Uh, if you look closely at the floor plans that were submitted, you'll see 
that there, if, if you're looking at the, the rendered view right now, in the lower left corner, you'll see the side of the building that is the residential side. There are two uh, passage doors that allow access to a room that is for um, uh, the dumpster totes, and then there's a stairwell that goes up. That is the space and point of access for the residential. That is completely walled off and has no access to the incubator spaces that are on the first floor. So there's a very clear defined separation between the um, residential uses and the uh, incubator spaces, even when it comes to points of access on the first floor. Okay, well that makes me feel a little better. Um, do you have any idea, and, and I'm not sure if you do or not, but I just thought I'd ask, do you have any idea as to who the tenants will be in the incubator space, what will be down there? Um, you know, it's a, a wide range of, of folks could be in there. Um, I mean, as simple as kind of car collectors to, um, you know, tradesmen um, that may have inventory there and work out of incubator space to some kind of light assembly, you know, type uh, type users. Um, so we don't have too many specifics quite yet. It's uh, we're just starting marketing following these meetings, but that's really kind of the range, Rick, of things that could be happening uh, in those spaces. Um, and they're, you know, either side of 2,000 square feet um, per per space depending on the space in the building. Okay. Each um, that makes, has a makes sense office in a, in a restroom for each incubator space uh, to give you a sense of the, but it's mostly open, um, open light industrial space. Okay. And as far as the parking goes, I guess, uh, is the parking, is the allotted parking based on residential or, or, warehouse or I guess how did you come up with the number or how did how so, do we come up with the number of parking spaces so the parking that is shown on this plan is based on the ordinance criteria for basically the two different types of uses that are on the site so for building B where you have a mix of residential and second floor uh, on the second floor with the apartment and the incubator space on the first floor the residential parking is all on the south side of building B. That's where you have your points of access to the apartments. And that is very clearly defined as those are the, the parking spaces for uh, the apartments on the second floor. There are 13 spaces that are proposed and the parking ratios are based on uh, the size of the units and what the ordinance requires for parking for residential apartments. So all the residential parking is on the south side of building B. No access to any parking for the incubator spaces in that south parking area. On the north side of building B and on the east and west sides of building A, the parking is provided based on the ratio for uh, a warehouse type space, which is two spaces per thousand square feet. So we meet the ordinance requirements uh, for that with the parking that's basically on the north end of the building, or north end of the site, if you will. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you, Rick. Um, <clears throat> I think they've done a good job covering most of the items here. Uh, I just got a quick question, um, and I know you, this is for preliminary. Have you given any further thought to the uh, power situation out there? Or should we expect to see a, kind of a more finalized version of the utilities uh, on, when you come back for final? Yeah, thanks, we're actively working with our electrical engineer and CMP on a, on a design. Um, so, and you know, we're, we're strongly considering just complying with the, the current approvals. So, um, but we'll keep you updated, you know, prior to final on, on this site. Thanks, uh, and then uh, this question for Jamel or Jay or Angela, um, the permit trading uh, over to the self storage is later on on the agenda. Do we need any f official action on that or is it just part of a, a swap that's 
being done as far as uh, overall count as these are approved? Um, I would say putting it in the record is, is good. Um, our traffic consultant did review the pr materials provided by the applicant and um, accepted that the trade will work. Um, so it's, it fits within the current state permitting, so I don't think any formal action is, is required for that. Okay. Uh, so with that said, um, they are requesting a preliminary approval this evening. Uh, they will have to return with some DEP and DOT work um, before we get to final. But uh, that said, I will make a motion for a preliminary approval for MRW Development LLC uh, for Lot 6 in the Innovation District. Second. Okay. I have a second. We have any further discussion? And a roll call vote. Rachel Hendrickson? Yes. Rick DuPerry? Yes. Roger Bealey? Yes. Nick McGee? Yes. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. Don't go far. <laughs> Item number six, MRW Development, LLC, requests a site plan review for lot seven within the Innovation District. Assessor's map, U53, lot seven. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so this project's located right next door. Um, very similar, if not identical building, a 18,000 square foot warehouse garage building. I was on lot seven within the innovation district. Um, again, this applicant was last before you all uh, in the middle of July. Um, so as noted in the staff review memo, again, uh, the DEP staff has indicated they're requiring an amendment to their subdivision stormwater permit. Um, the applicant has reached out to staff over the past, past few days, uh, has indicated that they could reduce uh, the, the impervious cover on this site uh, to meet the DEP uh, requirements and still meet the town's uh, off-street parking requirements uh, and stay within the 80% threshold. So the applicant should just be prepared to discuss any modifications to the site with the board and the board should be sure to uh, provide your direction uh, based on any um, modified plans that you may see. Uh, staff has continued to recommend uh, some buffering along the eastern property line um, for separation between lots uh, so that the board should provide uh, direction in regards that as well. At this point, we'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jamel. Uh, for the applicant, we have Mr. Bacon and Ms. St. Clair. Well, thank you. I've uh, put the composite plan back up on your screen. Um, you're pretty familiar with it at this point. Um, lot seven obviously is to the, to the right here of lot six, which we just discussed. Um, and I think at this point, I'd I'll, uh, I'll run the screen for you, Nancy. You can kind of update them on what we've changed um, since the last time uh, we were before them and our intentions on reducing the impervious area. Um, we had some additional um, parking that was above and beyond the ordinance requirement that um, we don't need, um, but we thought would, would be useful. So uh, Nancy can explain our approach with, uh, with that to to meet the DEP uh, expectations for a lot coverage. Sure. So, uh, Dan, before you switch that screen, uh, I did want to just kind of talk a little bit from that. Uh, very similarly with uh, Lot 6, Lot 7 had the benefit of having uh, two rounds of staff review and responses to comments. Uh, so things have uh, actually boiled down even more uh, on Lot 7, if you will. Uh, so we do have a couple of items we just want to speak to you about tonight. But uh, as Dan mentioned, uh, one of the things that we do want to talk to you about is some of the uh, additional landscaping that we've provided uh, in the interim since you last saw the plan. Uh, and that's in particularly uh, on the south side of Lot 7. We have a row of uh, proposed uh, Princeton Elms that are shown along the uh, southerly edge of the property. They show up on that. A graphic that Dan had there as well. But those have been added uh, since the introduction um, of the plan back before you in uh, July. In addition, we've added some more of those uh, Imelankiers along the uh, edge of the uh, site on the what would be the western side of the building on lot seven. The building on lot seven is the identical size and uh, layout, if you will, of the building on lot six. It's just 90 degrees perpendicular to it. Um, on the prior plan work that we had presented to you, uh, you can see sort of shadowed in that uh, graphic, there were five parallel parking spaces that were along the north side of the site. And the parking along the, what would be the northeast 
corner of the site extended further closer to the uh, edge of the property with the uh, addition of three parking spaces in that particular area there. With the um, revelation of the issue with the DEP and requiring some additional review by their office with regard to anything that was over the 80% lot coverage. What we have done with this plan is uh, develop what would sort of be an interim proposal, if you will, that would, <clears throat> excuse me, comply with the 80% lot coverage standard. Uh, and what we've done is those five additional parking spaces that were on the north side of the site I uh, have been uh, proposed to be eliminated with that approach. That would bring our uh, parking to 36 parking spaces uh, on the site. We had previously proposed 41. Um, <clears throat> the three spaces that are right where Dan's cursor is have actually been shifted over uh, to <clears throat> the area at the easterly edge of the parking in front of the building. Uh, we have those as dash driving right in that location there. <clears throat> this allows us to demonstrate that we meet the ordinance requirements at 36 parking spaces. But it brings us down uh, with that proposed revision to 79.74% uh, impervious coverage. So we are below that 80% threshold uh, and would be in accordance with the existing site location permit for the innovation district. So our approach to this is to uh, demonstrate to you folks that with this modification, this reduction in the amount of impervious area, we can meet the state standards and uh, we can still meet the local requirements for parking uh, on the site. Uh, in the future, if the applicant were to um, obtain its approval for the expanded impervious cover, remembering that we've already addressed the um, BMP requirements, we're providing treatment in that bioretention cell for that extra impervious cover, we'd like to have the opportunity uh, to actually add those parking spaces back in uh, once there was an approval uh, by the DEP. So uh, this is our uh, approach to hoping that this will provide a solution that will allow us to seek approval tonight, allow us to move forward, but recognizing uh, that ultimately once the DEP permits are in hand, there would still be the opportunity to uh, build it as we had originally proposed it uh, on the site. The last couple things that I did want to talk to you about was uh, Jamel had mentioned about uh, additional screening and buffering along what would be the easterly side of this building, which is basically from where Dan's cursor is up the property line uh, in that area there. <clears throat> Those trees, there's one, you see there's a tree up in that area, that's a Princeton Elm. We've got a Princeton Elm at the end of our proposed parking on the, uh, <clears throat> what would be the south uh, east side of the building. And then those two trees that are immediately to the east of it are actually uh, pine trees that are part of a row of proposed pines that are on the adjacent site plan uh, that's before you folks tonight for uh, the prime site, which is adjacent to this site. We wanted to also show you, we've, we've shown in sort of real time context, that's the, that sort of orange square is the building location uh, for uh, that uh, building on that site, the last uh, storage building that's on that site. And then there's a fenced in area that goes up along the property line. So along that edge, we spent a bit of time talking to the engineers representing that project. In that uh, sort of area on the abutting lot, that's a fenced in area that will be planted with wildflowers. Uh, the fencing is a uh, black coated fencing so you do have some screening that will be happening associated with that fence. On our site plan we also have uh, wildflowers planted in that area so we feel that it's a good coordinated effort in that area um, but are not feeling that anything beyond that with regard to any additional landscaping would be warranted based on the, the proposed uses on either side uh, of the property line. So um, Obviously, we'd like to talk to you folks about that. Uh, the next thing I wanted to just show you folks is the building itself. Uh, it looks very similar from a design standpoint, but the colors are different. These are in the gray tones uh, for the site, and these would be able to definitely clearly show that 
The development on lot six and lot seven are coordinated, but they're complementary to each other. So um, the building colors are different, but the building design itself is, is very, very similar uh, in nature to the site. And again, with the last uh, uh, presentation that we made, we do have a number of waivers that we're asking for. Uh, one of which is the minimum driveway separation, and it's for actually the driveway that's on uh, the uh, southwest corner of our site and the driveway that's located on uh, the residential piece on lot six. Uh, in addition, we are proposing similarly, um, as we did on lot six, to reduce the drive aisle width in the parking areas down to 24 feet uh, from 25. So we are asking for a reduction uh, in the commercial driveway width of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, 24 feet to accommodate that as well. Uh, so those are our waivers, and we certainly would appreciate the opportunity to gather your input on this site. We are here tonight to seek site plan approval for this particular project. Thank you, Nancy. <clears throat> we do have an opportunity for public comment this evening. If anyone uh, here in the public or on the Zoom meeting would like to uh, speak, please use the raise my hand feature. Is all clear, Angela? Okay. I'm not seeing any. Yeah. So I'll close public comment. Um, <clears throat> Rachel? Yep. Yeah. Um, this, this is, a, is uh, just a little strange for a meeting with some of our folks on screen and us <laughs> here. Um, I, I actually have almost no questions. I don't know what happened. Uh, <laughs> something must have. Uh, if you could just remind me again on the uh, <coughs> eastern side of the building, the northeastern side of the building, there's that expansive green space. What is going to happen to that? Um, if you're talking where Dan's purser is right now. No, down below, in between the building and the, and the elm tree. So right in that area there, we had previously proposed three parking spaces, and we have adjusted our proposed impervious uh, lot coverage to go down below the 80% by taking those three spaces and striping the pavement that was originally in front of the building right in that uh, corner there to put those spaces in that location. So we have had a no net change of parking, if you will, in, in that area, but it's basically restriping existing paved area, and that paved area would not be built unless we receive an approval from the uh, DEP for the coverage over 80% on the lot. I guess my question is, why are you considering paving it? Why aren't you leaving it natural uh, at the point at which you, um, if you do get the approval, then you can pave it, but meanwhile, you could put the continued the wildflowers or put a couple of small decorative bushes there. Um, that definitely would decrease the amount of uh, impervious space. Uh, with the original design that we had there, uh, we had accommodated for those spaces being spaces that would be permanently marked, uh, and that would give. Uh, parking right proximate to the office space of that last uh, incubator space. Right now, uh, with the program, one of those three spaces would be permanently marked. The other two would be reserved spaces. So it just simply had given a little bit more defined, delin uh, delineated parking for that end unit. Uh, but it is something that we can work with uh, either way. It, it, it does seem to me that um... You don't know if you're going to get approval to add those spaces. Um, mm -hmm. Just simply putting in the asphalt and then striping simply means that you've got more impervious space. You might want to start off with uh, a landscape area, not dramatically landscaped, but um, but the continue the wildflower plantings. Yeah. Uh, and okay. at some point, you can then put in the asphalt and, and stripe if you have that permit. That's it. Yeah, that's exactly what we'll do. Okay. Um, where we would we would do the, the wildflower planting consistent with um, just to the south of that. So we're, we're pleased to do that. Right. Thank you. And that's all I have. Thanks, Rachel. Roger. <clears throat> um, I, um, I, 
I think it looks um, really, really good. Um, I, I'm satisfied with the um, with the rationale for the um, for along the eastern side of you know of the, of the property utilizing the wildflowers. I'm pleased that one, one advantage of this whole development is the coordination between the different sites, which I think is very, very beneficial. Um, I, I have no problem with the uh, waiver request. So, uh, and I think I just want to comment. I think that um, the, the combination of the three buildings, the, the buildings in lot six and this one, I like the color color scheme on, on all of these. I think it looks nice. So um, I'm, I'm pretty well satisfied. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. Rick Dupere. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm okay with the waves. I do have a question that uh, something Rachel might ask. Um, I'm looking down at this building on the screen and are there any picnic tables or anything? Or, I mean, it doesn't look like you could come outside and sit anywhere and, and just seems to me like, am I missing something? I mean, is there, is there a common space right across the street? That I'm that I'm not seeing on the map. I mean, yeah. if you want to go outside and eat lunch in these COVID times, is there a place to go? Uh, well, there's a couple of ideas we have. I mean, in, in some cases, tenants will um, provide their own kind of outdoor seating areas. We've designed. If you can see the screen, Rick, we've designed uh, the spaces in front of the doorways, the the entry doors um, to each tenant space to have to have room um, outside of parking where people can set up chairs, there can be a bike rack, some planters, um, a place to, to eat lunch um, on site. And then also uh, like the last presentation we did in lot six, um, we have the, the trail system and the walkways to get down to the pavilion. Um, that's really not that far, um, 500 feet down the street um, at the intersection of uh, Center Street Innovation Way, which is a great place to, to do that, as well as the trail system. And we are considering um, adding um, some seating close to the pond, which is to the left of um, lot six. I don't have it. Well, there we go. <laughs> Presentation from um, the last agenda item. So, you know, if you can see the screen here uh, over in this area, we've considered doing some kind of informal space for, for the same reasons you brought it up. So I think there can be on site, not too far away, as well as uh, down on Innovation Way. So there's, a, I think, a number of options. So, so yeah, I'll leave that up there for a second. So you're saying that where the swim pond is, you're going to have some picnic tables and something, or because if not, they're going to walk down there and sit on grass, right? So we have talked about. I mean, the, the association. Some benches. Sorry, go ahead. Um, or some benches, or you know, something permanent that's always going to be there. Like if I walk through Lincoln Park in Portland, there's some benches that have been there probably for a hundred years. Um, and, and then you set up by Innovation Way. There's. I, I know you put your hand up here by Innovation Way. Is there? Is that where the common? So that they so they could sit on that concrete there and kind of eat underneath the shade. Yeah, and this is it's more than Nick can jump in here. It's more than concrete um, too. He's added some um, seating elements that go on top of the concrete and so. Yeah, there's. I, yeah, I don't mind jumping in. Um, there's a there's actually a, a few benches that are that are kind of placed on top. They're they're wood bench tops on top of the the concrete walls. Um, and there's quite a bit more planting out there today. I'd, I'd encourage anyone to go out and take a look. Um, the, uh, the developer has done a great job of, um, of, of making a real place here. And as Dan said, it's really not that far um, from lot six or seven. So um, yeah, this would be a great spot to, to eat lunch. So you're saying that there's some benches that aren't shown that yes, sit on this, top of that concrete? Or yeah, sit in this, front of the concrete? Yep, this image is um, about a month old, and now there are benches out there on top that they're bench tops on top of the concrete. Um, and so those were custom detail details that we designed, and uh, they came out great. This image is just kind of an in progress image. Okay, so how long does it take me to walk from where your hand is right now on that screen to 
that incubation space? Uh, a few minutes. A few minutes, yeah. So, so it's just a couple minutes. Um, if you can see my hand, it's yeah. where we just were. That photo is taken here. Yeah. Um, and the site is up here. And so this is about 500, 600 feet uh, to this okay. location. So, okay. And if I don't want to, if I don't want to sit there in that in the uh, intersection, mm -hmm. then I could walk down to the swim pond, and down the swim pond, I'm sure you'd consider putting some permanent tables and benches. We're, maybe yeah, we're looking at an informal programming here that would have a, a seating area. It just isn't part of this application because it's it's part of the subdivision. Um, so that's something that I'll talk to the to the partners about. Uh, further, um, and it's it's a nice spot, and it's a nice view of. This is actually the SWN stands for stormwater, but maybe you could swim in it too. <laughs> yeah, what happens? So, you know, I I, I know Dan, you're a man of your word, and as you say, you're gonna talk to some folks and get some. But I would expect, you know, if we give your approval on this on these buildings here tonight, then when we look at those buildings that have nothing on them to the right then my good friend Rachel and myself would ask again where that space making area is with the, you know, some, some sort of something that's going to be there for a while and just give someone, if they're having a bad day, they can walk down and sit on the bench by the pond rather than walk. I, I would rather not sit. I, I, it, I'm sure there would be days that I'd walk up to that intersection and, and enjoy the, but yeah, well, we think yeah. it's a great amenity for the entire project, so we're, um, we'll put our heads together and, and uh, figure out a plan for that, right? Okay, that would be good. Thank you. That's all I have. Thanks, Rick. Uh, I don't have a whole lot to add. Um, we, <clears throat> we didn't really cover them individually. I think maybe Roger mentioned it. Uh, waiver requests, everyone comfortable with that? Okay, we do have a prepared motion this evening. I will start to read that. I move to approve the site plan project titled Lot 7 Innovation District as depicted on the plan set prepared by St. Clair Associates dated 831.20 with the following findings, waivers, and conditions. Findings. The applicant is proposing to construct an 18,000 square foot building consisting of warehouse slash garage space. The proposal is located on Lot 7 of the approved Innovation District subdivision within the Downs. Property is located at the end of Dynamic Drive and is located within the Crossroads Plan Development CPD Zoning District. Planning Board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design of the site plan adequately addresses the site plan review, zoning ordinance, and the Innovation District regulating plan requirements for site utilization and layout access, internal vehicular movement, parking, pedestrian ways, landscaping, stormwater management, lighting, architecture, signage, utilities, and storage. Waivers, one. Permit the proposed driveway separation of 68 feet along Dynamic Drive. Two, permit the proposed driveway width of 24 feet for both driveways on the site. Three, permit the proposed parking aisle width of 24 feet. Conditions, one, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall revise the plan set to include A, additional wildflower provisions within the northeast portion of the site as discussed with the planning board. B, additional plantings adjacent to the proposed transformer on the property for screening purposes. C the proposed underground electric utility lines for the building along Dynamic Drive. D, a detail of the proposed trail connection with the northwest portion of the site. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Two, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall A, pay the traffic impact fees. B, provide approval by the Scarborough Sanitary District. C, coordinate with the fire department in regards to fire suppression related to the closest hydrant and required fire department connection of the building. D, coordinate with the police department in regards to addressing the proposed building. I'm sorry, regards to the addressing for the proposed building. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Three, the individual tenants will have their own waste receptacles within their units, which will be collected by a private commercial waste hauler. No shared dumpster is proposed. Four, future parking spaces may not be constructed prior to securing the required amended main DEP permit. Five, prior to the issuance of a sign permit, the applicant shall provide a final signage plan. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Six, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. That is the motion. Do I have a second? Second. 
I have a second. We have some discussion on this. Can I ask a clarifying question? Yes, you may. <laughs> um, it was slightly discussed, but I want to make sure we're clear, because um, we haven't seen revised plans, that the stormwater features that, have, that are associated with the impervious area that's future, I guess, can, Nancy, can you um, tell us, is that, going, is that still part of the plan set? Those will still be constructed, even if the impervious area associated with them is not at this time? Um, if it's determined that we can't ultimately uh, do that at all as far as the expanded parking, uh, then there's a chance that it would not be built. But we're confident that we can work it through with the DEP. And as part of that, those would be built on the site. So I guess through the chair, maybe it would help clarify things to modify or suggest <laughs> to you um, looking at number four that the future parking spaces may not be constructed prior to securing the required amended DEP permit and the associated stormwater treatment facilities be, are constructed, something to that effect, mm -hmm. so that they're connected. Because obviously, like you said, you're not going to do one without the other, but I just want to make sure those are, those are connected. And that would be a suggestion for staff. OK. That Thank makes you. sense for us. OK. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any other discussion on this? No. So do I have a motion to amend item number four to read, future parking spaces may not be constructed prior to securing the required amended main DEP permit and associated stormwater facilities are constructed? So moved. I have a motion and a second. Yes. I have Roger as a second. Discussions on the amendment? No. All in favor of the amendment, uh, Roger Bealey? Yes. Richard Perry. Yes. Rachel Hendrickson. Yes. Nick McGee. Yes. So I have an amended motion uh, and I have a second. Any further discussion on the amended motion? No. Rachel Hendrickson, are you in favor? Yes. Roger Bealey. Yes. Richard Perry. Yes. Nick McGee is yes. Congratulations. You have approval. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Uh, and I did receive word that uh, as long as my colleagues here are comfortable, I, I may remain maskless as long as we are appropriately spaced. If anyone here feels uncomfortable with that, please let me know and I will put it back on. What's that? So I'm assuming it's okay. I'm also maskless for finding. You're all set? All right, great. <laughs> I think you should put it back on. <laughs> you don't get a vote, you're at home. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next item on tonight's agenda, Maine Life Care Retirement Community, Inc. requests a site plan amendment and groundwater and well monitoring plan review for 5 Dorado Drive, Assessor's Map R91, Lot 1D. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so as you may recall, uh, this project's located along Dorado Drive off of Spur Wink Road. Uh, the board granted approval for the project uh, over a year ago, back in July 2019. The applicant has submitted a site plan amendment application and a groundwater and well monitoring plan for review this evening. The proposed modifications include adjustments to utilities, uh, the sewer pump house, lighting, sidewalks, and landscaping on the site. So the applicant should be prepared to discuss these proposed uh, modifications with the board this evening. Given the proximity to abutting properties at the site, Staff has recommended the applicant utilize house side shields and the proposed light fixtures along Henry Drive to help minimize any unnecessary lighting uh, in the area. And finally, the town's civil consultant has provided comments related to the required groundwater and well monitoring plan. The applicant should discuss this plan with the board this evening, uh, given it was a requirement set forth within the board conditions of approval uh, from July 2019. I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Jamel. I appreciate it. Uh, for the applicant. Yes, this is Jim Seymour here. Hi, Jim. Hi. Thank you. Uh, board members, uh, as Jamel uh, kindly outlined for you, I'm here tonight to represent Main Life Kia Retirement Community for the Meadows at Piper Shores. Uh, this was approved back in July 22nd, 2019. Um, during that uh, approval, there were some conditions uh, which we have addressed, but there was one condition that had to come back to the board for final approval, and that had to deal with the well monitoring uh, during the blasting phasing of the project. 
since that time, we've got into construction documents and we've had some tree clearing as part of the initial start of the project. So we've had some minor revisions, which the staff felt we should bring to you as well. So I will start with going in line with the memo that I provided you and the outline letter that I provide you. Um, given this drawing right here, one of the larger changes that occurred had to do with the relocation of the pump house. Originally, if you can see, it was down here on the end of Rand Lane. We have since moved that pump station to the end of the trailhead parking for the conservation easement. That location provides a little bit more buffer for the residents in the estate pocket and for the abutters of the entire parcel. This kind of sets it out in the middle of the, of the holding, if you want to call that, and is completely surrounded by the conservation easement. That will provide more buffer than they originally had down at the end of the other street and provides us a little bit better security uh, location for the trailhead parking. I do know that we did receive a comment from the public. Um, one had to deal with the concerns of landscaping and lighting of the pump house. Uh, this is an 18 by 18 uh, pump house, not much larger than a storage shed. There are two doors that face the parking lot that will have just a normal everyday light at that doorway. No other lights are proposed. Um, in time, if necessary, a security camera may go up on the side of the building to monitor what's going on at the trailhead parking. Other than that, we don't anticipate uh, any other lighting at that location. As far as buffering goes, as I mentioned, uh, you have roughly 120 feet of buffer from the pump house to the property line, um, with the majority of that being a conservation easement, which cannot be touched. Uh, even there is some young upgrowth uh, right there at that pump station, which will probably well exceed the height of the pump house in a very short time. So we feel that there's adequate uh, provisions for buffer to the neighbors. Uh, other changes uh, within this area, um, because the pump house was here, uh, extension of a water line and force main, those were pretty simplistic uh, and it had no real implications on the plan whatsoever. Uh, other uh, utility changes, um, again, all minor electrical, uh, doing the light, the lighting layout for the project. Uh, we had to relocate a few underground utilities. Again, those were very minor and insignificant. Um, but with that, uh, the design team for the project also decided to drop the height of the poles in the pocket neighborhood, which is the first neighborhood closest to Spurwing. Uh, those poles were dropped from, I believe, 20 feet to 14 feet. Um, because of that, uh, we had to add a few more poles in to have the same light coverage in that neighborhood. But the general feeling was the lower light levels would provide a, a more neighborhood atmosphere in that pocket neighborhood and not have that commercial glow to it. Um, this, in addition, also benefits any of the neighbors concerned about lighting. It just lowers that lighting by six feet can, can have a substantial difference. Uh, two other lights were added in the estate neighborhoods, mainly for the crossing right here uh, because we didn't have very adequate lighting in there. So a pole light was added there and a bollard light was added on the other side. Um, some landscaping improvements. Um, during the site visit we made in April, uh, we did notice that there were some um, uh, areas that were cut from the previous owner primarily out on the main pond and the main drag between a property. This current owner bought the property to the southeast and is, is, re, uh, is building a new home there. They had cut that property line. Uh, Piper felt for privacy purposes they wanted to reestablish that line. So we've added a blend of trees in there of Norway spruce, hemlock, and some magnolias to kind of give it a nice blend. Uh, in addition, there was another backyard off the end of the hybrid uh, commons units uh, in the southwest corner where there was really, once the trees were cut, we found that there was kind of a hole in there in the back of the, I believe it's the Yao property. So again, we, we displaced some more uh, fir trees in there, evergreens to kind of give it a permanent buffer. Um, Sidewalk updates. Uh, I believe this was a condition that was originally left for the planning staff to resolve. We've had several communications with uh, DOT and the town with, res with regards to the trail crossing or pedestrian crossing. 
Uh, at that time back in July, I think the, the program was hopefully that we could get the speed limit reduced uh, and have a formal pedestrian crossing. However, after several testing and, and discussions with DOT and the town, uh, that speed limit did not meet the warrants. Um, so the speed limit would have to remain at 45. So again, having many discussions, it was determined that the, the best way to have the cross connectivity would be with a uh, public trail crossing at that location. Um, so that's where we are today. And to accommodate that, we made some minor changes to the sidewalk near the entrance of the um, entrance of the drive. So um, that essentially all of the uh, small amendments and then the, the largest one had to deal with the well testing protocol. Uh, we um, contracted with SW Cole, who will be our geotechnical engineers and who will be administering the well testing provisions during the blasting program. Um, you were outlined with program which will identify all of the uh, abutters within a thousand feet of the proposed Piper Shores. Uh, it outlines timelines when they will be offered an opportunity to get into the well monitoring program. Uh, this will continue for three years. Um, we'll have you know periodic testing throughout the blasting, periodic testing following the the completion of the project, um, and you know all the testing parameters will match the DEP water testing guide as well as the EPA guidelines. So that would cover us for things such as pathogens, bacteria, heavy metals, uh, nutrients, uh, radon, and so on. Um, there was a memorandum from Woodard and Curran. Uh, we are agreeable to the conditions uh, on that. And as I mentioned, we've, we've outlined the uh, contaminants we'll be testing for following new well testing under the DEP guidelines and following EPA uh, regulations. So I guess I'll keep it simple. I, I'm guessing you have some questions for me, uh, but that is all I have at this time. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have an opportunity for public comment on this item. If you are a member of the public and would like to speak, please use the raise my hand feature on your Zoom application. All right, seeing no public comment, I'm going to close public comment and turn it over to the board. Roger, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Um... I'm going to start off with um, S.W. Cole. Can't, I'm going to assume that the uh, issues raised by Woodard and Curran would be ironed out between staff, you know, um, uh, you know, Angela and the and the uh, and the applicant. Uh, is that a fair assumption? Um, yes, I have actually reached out to. Uh, uh, would it encourage to get their input on the responses? Uh, I have not received those yet, but I don't think that there's anything here of substance uh, that cannot be worked out between staff. I think they're they're excellent the recommendations, and uh, like I said, we're going to be following DEP and EPA guidelines as far as uh, analytes that we'll be uh, reviewing. Okay, good. Um, is uh, Angela? Are you satisfied with that? Um, yes, I think we can work it through with, I guess, as long as you guys are comfortable with um, using that as the criteria, really, the state and kind of federal guidelines, if there's anything additional that, um, any focus that you need um, us to look at, I guess that's the only clarity I would need from this group. Okay. Um, I, I want to compliment the, uh, the applicant for um, all the upgrades of the um, enhancements to the landscaping. Um, I'm kind of curious, have you had any communications with um, the Yows up there by the Commons building? I don't believe we have. I think that was all made by ourselves, um, kind of self-reporting that we just observed the, the holes in the canopy there and felt it was just our, in our best interest and their best interest to, um, you know, to plug that hole if you want to call it that. Okay, good. Um, and um, I just, I, I just, a, just for my own knowledge, on the pump stations, do 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 the pump stations do the pumps make any kind of noise? I'm just kind of curious. Uh, very little noise. The only thing that would make noise is if there's a power outage and you have a backup generator. 
then you okay. may have some noise, but both the generator and the pump station are contained inside the shelter. So that again will reduce any noise that could be generated. Okay, and on the, um, I guess the last question I have, I, I think everything looks really, going along really, really well. Um, on the, uh, uh, what did you call it, the, the trail or crossing, crossing um, screwing, what's, what's the term you use for that now? Pedestrian trail crossing. Oh, trail crossing, yeah, okay. Um, so, so what is, so th the issue was you wanted to put some sort of a signal in there? Well, it was a signal, it was a formalized crosswalk. The, the issue is uh, due to the speed limit, uh, we cannot have that kind of crossing at that location per DOT standards. Um, so what was determined was you can have a trail crossing which I guess in simplistic terms um, uh, takes the liability from the driver to the trail hiker. Uh, if you have a pedestrian crossing, they have the right of way. In this case, uh, with all the signage and everything we'll have to propose, uh, the liability is on the trail crosser to follow those instructions. Could, um, with, with the trail crossing, can you put those um, yellow signals, you know, that you see a lot of pedestrian crossing? No signals. Under DOT, there, well, the issue is there are no DOT standards for trail crossing, so there cannot be any signalization or any pavement markings on the pavement. So, so, so there won't even be any pavement markings across the road there? Correct. All there will be is guidance on both sides of the street with landing areas and a ton of signage. Okay, all right. Um, Again, we've worked with staff and DOT and feel like this is the really the only solution we could come up with to to have the connectivity sure yeah um you know i know we've had a lot of discussion about that that stretch of um route 27 spruing down there regarding pedestrians and everything and it's really remarkable in the summertime i'm, I'm on that road quite often and what's interesting at the higgins beach market going towards black point road there's about i would say maybe a two foot to a two and a half foot shoulder on, e on either side of the road. But going the other way towards Pleasant Hill Road, there's hardly any shoulder at all. So it's extremely dangerous going that way <laughs> for anybody who's walking. Yeah, and to your point, we had quite a, a lengthy meeting with uh, public safety, uh, planning staff, town engineer, and DOT. and. Trust me, all these things came up, but DOT basically said their hands were tied. They could not change the speed limit. And, and they can't change the speed because if they did a testing, if they tested it, they'd probably find that everybody's going 45 miles an hour. Correct, and the volume is there as well. Yeah, or possibly they could even increase the speed. <laughs> uh, I, I hope they don't do that, but uh, I don't think that's the interest. I think 45 is, is manageable at this point. Okay, um, I think it's now. Have you have you guys done anything up there? Any kind of uh, construction or excavation or anything? No, the the only thing that's been happened up there is they did the tree clearing in late winter, early spring. Is the um, um, McDonald's home still there? McDonald's home is still there. I believe someone is still residing in that uh, structure. Uh, the game plan at this point is for a late winter, early spring start of all construction. Is, is that home going to be relocated or just demolished? I believe at this time, unfortunately, it's going to be demolished. Oh, that's too bad. I could have given them a good price for that. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe that door's still open, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it could fit on my property. That's the problem. Okay, I'm all set. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Roger. Uh, Rick DePere? We'll come back to Rick. Rachel? Yeah, um, Roger asked uh, the question I was going to ask. I, I guess I, I just need some confirmation. Um, Bill Bray for August 18th report recommends the replacement of signs, um, and addition of supplemental signs. Is that what you intend to do to follow uh, his recommendation? Yes, we've made, those rec we've made those changes to the plan and have submitted those to the DOT. Uh, along with uh, uh, Mr. Um, uh, the traffic engineer's report. Um, so we're, we're waiting for confirmation that they've received that. 
Again, I, I don't believe there's any formal process for a trail uh, crossing, but uh, DOT will acknowledge receipt and acceptance. All right, thank you. That's all the questions. Thanks, Rachel. I do um, just a <clears throat> probably a public uh, public knowledge type of question here. So I was looking through the uh, plan for the well water um, monitoring program. So I, I see, you know, there's plenty of information about how you go about testing it and collecting it and storing the data. And then one of the one of the last items here says individual well testing results will be provided to property owners upon request. So I guess my question is, is if if these uh, results were tested and they were perfectly fine and then we do some blasting and then we find out in the well that we've got some adverse effects to the well water, why wouldn't we automatically notify an owner? I mean, I gotta believe that's just a piece of mail. Why would they have to actually reach out and contact you to request that information? I, I don't think they would. I think we would notify them. Plus understand that all these findings will be public information held at the town as well. They receive all the, uh, all the information. So. I don't see why we could not make that uh, available to the individual homeowner, especially where it is their well that is the issue. Um, so I think that's a modification we can make. Okay, thanks. And then um, as far as uh, remedies, I didn't see anything about remedies and I understand that every situation might be a little different, but do we go as far as putting in uh, reverse osmosis systems into homes if they do have an impacted uh, well site, or is it an attempt to find a different site? And I got to believe they're probably all tapping into the same water table. Um, so, what what can you talk about some of the remedies that maybe you've seen or experienced, and how what homeowners might be able to expect if they did have an, an adverse impact here? Well, I, I think if they had an adverse impact with the availability of public water, the first opportunity may be to offer public water. Uh, if that's not a solution, then to your point, there may be additional treatment systems, depending on what we're seeing for elevated elevations that consider it contaminated uh, drinking water. So uh, it could be anything from the treatment system to even possibility of a new well. Uh, but most of the time in these cases, if there's the availability of public water, usually that's the, the resolution. And, and again, I'm sorry to keep uh, harping on this, but so let's just say there is a problem. Uh, what happens if there's a dispute about the resolution? So for instance, uh, you, you're coming in and proposing a point of use system versus an entire whole house system. The owner wants a whole house system. You're saying now nah, all you need it is under your tap and you, you want to call it a day at that. How does that resol get resolved? Um, that's a great question. I, I don't know if I have the uh, litigious background to answer that question. Um, I think you, you'd probably go into some kind of negotiation uh, as if you would any other uh, disagreement. And uh, if you can't come to a solution, then maybe it does head to litigation. But most of the time, uh, what I've seen, uh, the times I've dealt with this have to do more with stone quarries when you have really deep blasting. And in most cases, uh, the owners of the operation that is doing the blasting, as I mentioned, either offer a new water connection or potentially a new well um, I think everybody tries to stay away from treatment systems because that's a, a longer duration of maintenance uh, with a lot of unknowns. So I think the first thing is to find a, a, a new source that is clean and meets all the drinking water standards. So is there a, a um, kind of an FAQ that would go out to homeowners like, you know, we've been monitoring this and here's what happens if there is a problem. Is there some sort of uh, place that owners can go to either find that information or do we distribute to them? Uh, and, and please just understand, I want to make it clear, I'm sure there are people at home that haven't raised their hands that are very interested as to how this is going to impact, you know, their current wells. So I just want to try to make sure that we're at least trying to provide them the access and the information uh, that they may need going down the road if there was a problem. Yeah, and I think what would happen is with the initial uh, invite, uh, we could put together some kind of FAQ with that invite to explain the process, what happens, um, and answer any immediate questions as far as what is being tested, where it's tested, and how to retrieve your results. All right, I appreciate that. Um, that was it on my end. Rick DuPerry, if you're back on, do you have any questions? For yeah. The yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I was a little bit slow on the unmute on the last time. Um, I have questions very similar to the, the kind of to expand on what you were asking uh, or discussing. 
Nick, um, I don't like to leave this gray because wells are a big deal. Um, you know, you can have the prettiest house on the street, nicest house on the street, and if you don't have water, the house isn't worth anything. And, and these people have lived there a long time. So, a couple things. Um, before I was to, you know, vote positively for anything, uh, the wells would have to be tested, the existing wells. Those reports would have to be given to the homeowners. If at any time in the future, and I guess we're talking three years, is that what we said? Um, yeah. And that three years, how, how long is this construction going to take? Are you anticipating start to finish a year? You're going to start this spring and you're going to be done next spring? No, this, this will be longer than a year. And I believe it's three years upon completion uh, of the blasting is when the, the terms end. Okay. I'd like to see that in writing three years from completion of the of the blasting or three years from completion of the project, I guess. I believe that's in the document. Um, okay. Um, you believe it's in the document? You know it's in the document? Um, I'm trying to look through the documentation now. I didn't see it. The last but, bullet item on page, uh, excuse me, but the very last bullet item. Post-construction monitoring period, SW Coal will perform groundwater monitoring rounds every six months for three years following substantial completion of the project. Okay, thank you. Um, so that's good. So like I'd, I'd like to see those reports with the initial well, um, with, with the water quality given to each and every um, homeowner in that area that could be affected <clears throat> and then I hate to leave it gray and litigation and these people don't have money for litigation and, and Piper Shores you know does um, so I'd like to see that if at any time their water, water quality water quality deviates in a negative manner from their existing water quality then Piper Shores will return their water quality to the existing or better state than it was in before they started. And I'd like to see that in writing. I don't want to leave it up to Gray and, well, we'll maybe a point of use or whatever. Like, you know, Nick's a smart guy. He knows how all that, all, all that works. I, I, I want to see their water quality remain the same. And if it doesn't remain the same, then it needs to be brought back to the same quality it was pre-construction. And, uh, and I need to see that. I need to see that. And I don't want to talk about litigation and stuff like that. I want to, I want to see that. I want to know that that's going to happen. Well, I don't think litigation is something. I know Piper will do all it's right to, to preserve these people's water. I think the question, I, the only question I have is uh, existing or, you know, to the quality of existing or better, I would just stick to the standards that we initially I described, which would be the EPA and the new well test provisions under the DEP guidance, because that's gonna give you the highest quality of drinking water that, that you can have. Um, and, and I think that's where we wanna go, because what if somebody had a background of high iron concentrate or, or, or high metal or something like that, and some disturbance does come along, then what do we do? You know, Now that, now that standard's kind of wishy-washy. If we're gonna set a standard, I would recommend that uh, if the well does fall below uh, a substantial level under the EPA guidelines, that it has to be brought up to the level that meets the main drinking water standard and the EPA under the EPA guidance. Okay, I mean if that's if that's what's best for the homeowner. Um, that sounds. I mean that obviously would be acceptable. So, but I, can we can we put that in writing somewhere so that we can. I, yeah, we can work with staff and we're encouraged to find the appropriate, you know, uh, where in the plan we can put that. Okay. I mean, as long as we're in agreement on that, I mean, I do like, I like what you're doing out there. I think it's a good thing for the town. I think it's a good thing for, for people to have some place to go. I just don't want to see any of the folks that are already there adversely affected in any way. And, and I so think the other I appreciate yeah, and I think the other important piece to add to that is is that people have to opt in 
to allow us to do the testing up front to have that uh, protection, uh, I should say. So in other words, you can't just, okay. if you deny the test and then you come back and say your well is contaminated, well, that doesn't give us the background. So to opt in, you really have to give the permission to do the testing. And again, I think okay. we have to do that work with uh, Weird and Current to have that, um, that protocol put in. Yeah, that's a good point, and that makes perfect sense, and I appreciate you bringing that up. So when you say opt-in, I don't want these people to have to go to a website or figure this out, right? Oh, no. You're going to make you're going to go out and make contact with these folks correct. Yep, correct. and, and correct. proactively say, we need to test you well in order for you to have this protection, correct? Correct, correct. absolutely correct. And if they then at that point, they, they say they don't want to, uh, like I say, opt into the program, maybe opt in is the bad word, but they don't want to participate in the program, then they also lose that potential protection that they would have if something went wrong due to our negligence or, or blasting issues on site. Right, and that, make, and that makes sense. That makes sense to me as well. So I'm, I'm okay with that. And then the only other thing that, that kind of like what Nick mentioned was if for some reason there is a negative test, I also would like to have it somewhere in writing that if you, in the six months of testing, find a negative result, then it's the responsibility of Piper Shores to make the homeowners aware of that, that, that issue and to work to resolve it. Does that make sense? That makes sense to I don't me. Want, I don't want them to have to go, you know, I don't want you to send the information to the town and then, you know, they have to, I can't even get to the town to register my car. I don't want them to have to go to the town and say, oh, hey, I was my water this month. That's not going to work. They, no, and, and they, if if they, you they, find out there's a bad well somewhere, you need to let the person know as soon as possible before their kids drink that water. Yeah, and, and to, uh, that's exactly right. I mean, it's their well, it's their test. They should know that information. And I don't think Piper has any in, anticipation at all of trying to hide anything from this. It's open, it's transparent. Uh, that's the way we want it to be. I'm just thinking that again, when we uh, do the initial uh, letters to all the abutters that have wells, uh, that you know, part of that FAQ, again, we can make that clear that this is their information, it's private information, and we will share it with them. But uh, you know, I don't think everybody, maybe not everybody wants their, their water results made public, but uh, we will make it available for those individuals, whether through uh, a link or through direct mailings. Yeah, you know, and I understand what you're saying, I make, but I don't, I don't agree with the link or the direct mailing. It, it, if there's an issue, you need to reach out to them and make them aware, just like a good neighbor. Yep. And, and I know Piper Shores is a good neighbor. If if you are aware of an issue, you need to you need to let them know. Not don't send them a link. Don't you, you need to let them know. Um, well, that there's a problem. You send them a letter, or we make a call, one or the other. I mean, we're gonna when when we obviously get their contact information we'll have both their address their telephone numbers and their email so i mean again we we will do that we will reach out to them and let them know if there's an issue okay thank you for that i appreciate it now that's that's all i have that was my main concern i i do like the design and and what you're doing out there i have just one more question um actually originally i thought the plan was to bring public water into piper shores and now i see you're doing the well house so are you not doing public water anymore no the the, the well the public well house is is a it's a septic pump station not a well house we are oh, okay i thought you were, no, i we're thought you referred to it as a well house no no it's a it's a pump house sorry if i made that distinction but it is a a pump station okay so it's a waste pump station so correct. you are you do have public water correct we do okay so that's another stipulation that i would i i think it i think it would probably make the most sense um and i think we discussed this early on in the process if we're, if a well does go bad um in the three-year period if there's public water available, then I think that it would make sense if that's what the homeowner wants is to allow them to tap into that public water. Now, maybe maybe they don't want to do that because of the costs associated with public water, but um, I very strongly suggest that we make that an option. If, if, they have a, if they have a bad well, if the well goes bad, then 
then they at least have the option to, to tap into the public water. Yeah, and as I said earlier, most of my resolution that I've dealt with has been on quarries, and it's usually if public water is available, that's first. That's usually the first resource that people want: a dependable, clear, clean, clear water that's you know monitored and, and don't have to worry about it going down the line. But there is a cost with that. Um, so yes, I would agree with that as well. Well, the cost would be if the if the well goes bad in the three years, then I would assume that the cost of the public water would be would be funded by Piper Shores, right? I, I think the connection would be funded by Piper Shores, but I don't think the, the water usage would be. And I just want to make it clear too, we're not talking, most of these neighborhoods down here are on public water. There's only a handful of, of residents that we're aware of that are, are on wells or have wells. Right, and, and I, I understand you wouldn't pay for the water. But I, you pay for the connection, correct? Yep. Hopefully, we won't have to even go down this road. Hopefully, I, I don't think I don't you know, think going down that hopefully, road. Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully, everything you know stays the same out there. But you're close to the ocean. There's a lot of salt. You never know when you're blasting what's going to happen in that in that area. So that's why uh, not just that area. No, and that's why we want to do the pre the pre survey to understand the condition of the well before we even start, and so we have something to have as a baseline more or less to match up against pre and post construction. Okay, all right. Thank you. I appreciate it. that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Roger. Yes, I, I just have one uh, further question pertaining to this issue. Um, as um, as Rick was. Um, Jim, I was again looking at the um, SW Cole's report, and I, I just wanted to get a clarification on the use of the word substantially complete. Um, if I understood you, Jim, you said, uh, Rick asked you uh, basically how, uh, how, how long this project will take to be completed, and, and I get the impression it's going to take a little bit of time. It's not going to be something done like within a year or something like that. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So what's, what's substantially complete mean? Is that a percentage or? Uh, my understanding would be that would be the full build out, uh, the completion of the full build out, not just one phase, but the completion of the full build out. Okay. So let's say the whole build out is going to take three years or I'll say two years. And uh, so these wells would be checked every six months for the, dur for the duration of the build out and then three years after that build out. Correct. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, good. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions or comments from the planning board? All right. Uh, we're going to try to wordsmith this motion a little bit based on some of those discussions. Um, the, if I could jump in, I think we do have staff working on a digital version, yep. which is probably better than my chicken scratch. <laughs> um, so I'm going to try and uh, make that possible for Jay to share it. I'll be right okay. back. Uh, Thanks. Oh, minute. Sorry. Join a... <laughs> Angela, if you're in it, you can share it. That's fine. All right. Uh -oh. <laughs> okay, I think we're ready. I move to approve the site plan amendment titled The Meadows at Piper Shores as depicted on the plan set prepared by Sebago Technics dated 72920 with the following findings and conditions. Findings, the applicant is proposing several modifications to the utilities, lighting, sidewalks, and landscape on the site. The board also finds that the required groundwater and well monitoring plan satisfies the board's condition of approval from the July 2019 approval of the project. The proposal is located at 5 Dorado Drive and will utilize existing frontage along the Spurwink Road Property is located within an approved contract zone. The applicant has provided groundwater and well monitoring plan in accordance with prior approval. The board, uh, the planning board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design of the site plan accurately addresses the site plan review and zoning ordinance requirements for site utilization and layout, access, internal vehicular movement, parking, pedestrian ways, landscaping, stormwater management, lighting, architecture, signage, utilities, and storage. Conditions, number one. 
prior to the issuance of a building permit. The applicant shall revise the plan set and groundwater and well monitoring plan to address the remaining issues, staff review comments, and the memo dated 814. Uh, let's go with 914. 914, sorry. <laughs> 91420. Monitoring plan should be revised to ensure that the test reports will be provided to the applicable homeowner and if well and if a well falls below standards of the state of Maine or the EPA or below pre-blasting test results for groundwater quality, the developer shall remediate the issue to ensure the home has water meeting state and federal standards or equivalent to the pre-blasting testing results. Two, the applicant shall also address the civil and traffic peer review comments in the memos provided by Woodard and Curran and Traffic Solutions. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Three, all applicable prior planning board conditions of approval from July 2019 will remain in effect. That's the motion. Do I have a second on that? Second. I have a second, and I have a little discussion to add. Um, I'm not sure we quite hit it, but I would like to see... Um, I'd like to see, I see the developer submit or the applicant submit something in writing about a process for owners to seek remedy to planning the planning staff to review. Yeah, I think we did discuss that uh, as part of that condition was that uh, we would put an FAQ describing the, the process and contact information in the initial um, in the initial information packet to the homeowners. Yeah, I think that that would be helpful. That's just Are my two sets. Can you say that then? Yeah. The put, put it on staff the, or? Yeah, I think I think a, a process, a post, uh, you know, a adverse well impact <laughs> process. It's, it's to be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Something that can be shared with homeowners as well. Something easily accessible to the homeowners. And the only other item I would add is if there if there were negative impacts, and I know you've said this, uh, I just don't see it outlined here necessarily. Is uh, if there are adverse affected wells, that those are automatically reported to those homeowners, rather than the you have to request that information. Well, I guess actually you did cover that in the blue part. My bad. Yeah. Is that prior to uh, issuance of building permit also? I don't know if it's a monitoring approach as much as it is the remediation approach. Oh, okay. That I'm more concerned with. What happens next? I think we should have a kind of an established plan for that. Yeah, you just want kind of a process outline. So these, this is what happens during the testing. This is what happens if something goes wrong. Correct. Yes. That was very succinct. Can we borrow that? <laughs> <laughs> and Nick, did I hear you say that that's really you're looking for a plan that would go to the homeowners? I think the frequently asked question sheet should go to the homeowners. I, I think yep. I, I think uh, Jim has said it best here. You, Which you know, would be part of that, but. Part of your process. That would be part of the submit. process. Right. Yeah, it'd be, yeah, it'd be part of that initial uh, request for, for permission from the landowners. I think you just give them a whole packet with that in there. That that would be fine with me as long as we have it written down. What you know? Yeah, it would be a written. You you would get. I mean, you're you. The town is involved in all these processes either way, so you're going to get the same information as we're giving the all these uh, interested parties. Okay. So. I suppose, I guess that would be my motion in red. So I'll make a motion to amend uh, to include the applicant shall provide a process for the implementation of the remediation approach, which will be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Do I have a second on the amendment? Second. I have a second. Any discussion on the amendment? We'll call a vote on the amendment. Roger Bealey? Yes. Rick Duperry? Yes. Rachel Hendrickson? Yes. Nick McGee? Yes. So on the amended motion, any discussion? All right, seeing none, I'm going to call the roll. Rachel Hendrickson? Yes. Roger Bealey? Yes. Richard Duperry? Yes. Nicholas McGee? Yes. Thank you very much, and congratulations. 
you very much. Uh, I am showing us hovering at the two hour of session mark. I'm going to call a five to seven ish minute break. We will return uh, a little shortly. Thanks for your patience. Hmm. Doing a five, five minute break.
Welcome back. Uh, our next item on tonight's agenda is Devin Frederick, DBA, Frederick Brothers, requests a site plan amendment review for 19 Rigby Road, Assessor's Map R78, Lot 11. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this project's located in the industrial zoning district at the corner of Rigby Road and Commercial Road. So the applicant's proposing to reconfigure the existing parking layout on the site at a full access driveway along Commercial Road and place two 30,000 gallon fuel tanks on the property. The applicant was asked before the board for a sketch plan review in August, uh, where the board expressed that you were comfortable with the proposed full access driveway along Commercial Road. Staff has noted in the uh, review memo that the site plan standards require parking areas with 15 or more spaces to be broken up with trees, landscape islands, and other features to help break up impervious area. And staff has recommended uh, additional plantings within the areas labeled as uh, landscape or lawn areas on the plans. Staff has also noted that the plans indicate the building will utilize existing wall pack light fixtures for the project. And I'd like to confirm that these fixtures are updated to meet the town's current standard for full cutoff fixtures. And staff has prepared a draft motion uh, for the board's consideration uh, this evening, which was sent along earlier today. Thanks. Thanks, Jamel. And uh, Rick DePerry, if you could just confirm you're on the line with us. Nick, I'll try to give him a call, see if I can. I think he's just, him. he might just be on mute. Hi, Nick. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thanks for confirming. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right. With that said, uh, our applicant tonight, who do we have? Jason Vafianis. Jason, can you hear us? Yep. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Yeah, so hello, everybody. Uh, so, yeah, this is uh, Jamel uh, pretty much hit all the nails on the head. Um, I kind of, this project is not as complicated as some of the normal ones I have up here, so I think we can do this quick. Um, uh, I'm, I'm here on behalf of uh, Jason Baffiatis with Atlantic Resource Consultants here on behalf of uh, Frederick Brothers Oil. Uh, with me tonight is uh, Jody Amenden, who is the uh, propane tank installation specialist. So they do all the design and uh, permitting for the, um, for the, the 30,000 gallon propane tanks. Um, and if you have any questions about that, she's here to answer those. But um, in between when we made this original submission and when we got the comments back, we have responded to Jamel. Um, he didn't obviously get them in time for this meeting, but uh, so we, we've updated the landscape plan. Uh, we have uh, a lighting plan now and we are um, switching out those fixtures to full cutoffs uh, along the building. And uh, we made some tweaks to the tank area. We had to actually add a little extra loading bay um, length onto the back of them. Um, as Jamal flips through the plans, you can get a look at it. Um, really, there's not a whole lot here. Uh, we, we did sort of increase the, the, the landscape plannings on the exterior of the parking areas, um, just to sort of break up that the, the view of the parking areas. Um, I will note we're in a pretty well uh, industrialized part of uh, Scarborough. So, um, uh, you know, pretty much everything down here is a similar use. Uh, there's another gas uh, propane holding um, company further down Rigby Road. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, industrial uses there. But uh, this is a pretty simple, uh, not even amended site plan, but a, a reuse of an old industrial site. Um, I think the design works pretty well. And I know the Frederick brothers are excited about uh, getting over there and, and uh, doing the work and getting the tanks installed. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to the board if there are any questions. Thank you. Appreciate it, Jason. Uh, we have an opportunity for public comment this evening. If you are at home and would like to comment, please use the raise my hand feature on your Zoom function. Good, Angela. No. Okay. I'm going to close public comment. Uh, I'll just open this one up in general for the board. If there's any questions, uh, just raise your hand and let me know. Uh, or Rick Perry, just chime in if you have any questions specifically on this item. Roger. 
Yes, um, I agree with Jason. Uh, I mentioned this the last time they were before the board. This is really an industrial, industrial site. Um, in fact, when you're riding along Black, uh, Pleasant Hill Road, you can't even see the site. Uh, it's heavily uh, wooded, the vegetation, everything. I was going to ask Jason, um, there's, when, I, when I went down through there, right along Commercial Drive as well as Rigby Road, but mostly Commercial Drive, there's a lot of trees and every trees and brush and everything else right there already. Is that going to remain there or is that going to be removed? No, you, you raise a good uh, point, Roger. And actually, thanks for reminding me. So uh, I was down there with the, uh, the applicant and we were kind of going over the site and kind of laying things out and looking at it. There's actually in the, it's, it's shown as tree line on the plan, so the area behind the tanks. Um, the, the lot next door is another, uh, I believe it's a, uh, don't quote me on it, but I think it's like a, a, a heating and ventilation contractor or, or, or something like that. There's some, there's some old, forgive my French, but crappy pine trees there that we, we actually thought would be a, uh, it's a problem actually to have those near the, the propane tanks. Um, so I, if you're comfortable and, and with staff, we were going to move the tree line all the way back to the property line and then, and then replant with something that's a, something that can be maintained and won't fall on the tanks or in the tank area. Um, but it's so to the extent that we can, we'll save the existing vegetation sort of uh, around the ponds. And then we're there, those are infiltration ponds. So then, you know, there could be trees and stuff in them because that, uh, that, that area just kind of sucks up the water anyway. Um, but we would like to clear more vegetation around the tanks just, just to provide that level of safety. But uh, as far as on the road frontages go, we'll, we'll keep as much as we can. Yeah, be, because it, it seems to me like it's pretty dense vegetation there already. It's, it's, it's dense, scrubby, bamboo, you know, not, you know uh, bushes. So your goal was basically to leave as much of if, if, anything that's good there, you're going to leave it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll clear it out. We'll clean it up a little bit and anything that's a good, uh, good specimen we leave, but we take out a lot of the weedy, uh, okay. herbaceous, woody, whatever they, I'm sorry, I'm not a landscape architect, so I'm butchering this, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll leave the good stuff. I'll leave it at that. And I guess the only thing I would mention, the other thing is that, Regarding the stores, the snow stories that the um, staff comments. Yep, we, we added that to the new plans. Yep. Okay. Uh, I'm all set. Uh, Nick. Thanks, Roger. Rick or Rachel, do you have anything to add or a question? Rachel. Yeah. Um, this this just to satisfy my curiosity, I guess we we never really saw the uh, the building that's there. I'm looking at the um, the front. Uh, of the uh, of the plans, the um, the cover sheet, one of yeah, you know, the cover sheet, and you've got a the parking area with a handicapped accessible space. Is, is that where the door is to the building? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And is there another door down uh, to the other end of the building where the driveway appears to go in? There is a, yep, so the, uh, the, the back end of the building, there's actually a garage bay door there. And so we were, we were keeping the access to that in case they wanted to uh, bring a truck in and change a tire or, or work on it or, or something like that. Uh, so this, uh, this office will be used. You can actually go in and, they don't get a whole lot of foot traffic at their existing site, which is on Route 1 right now, but there are occasionally people that stop in and want to pay a bill or ask a question. So the front is going to be admin and office space. So that's what those parking spaces are for up at the front of the building is we, we, we verify that we have uh, ADA accessible uh, entrance to the building up there with the existing grades and with the repaving. Um, so we, we are providing public access as, as such as it gets used uh, to the front of the building. All right. And there's no problem with the truck uh, drive, one of your trucks driving in to that garage bay backing out and not being constrained by the um, by the tanks no 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 so so the trucks that they have that's actually a pretty that's a 16 foot wide backing in so they can back out 
they can drive straight in from commercial drive and then back out and pull out either way. Yeah, I'll, we, we ran all the turning templates as well. So okay, uh, okay, that's that's what I needed to know. All right, thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you, Rick to Perry. Anything else to add? No, I think I think my question has been answered. Okay, uh, that's it. I have a motion here. I move to approve the site plan amendment titled Frederick Brothers as depicted on the plan set prepared by Atlantic Resource Consultants dated 71320 with the following findings and conditions. Findings, the applicant is proposing to reconfigure the existing parking layout, add a full access driveway along Commercial Road, and place two 30,000 gallon fuel tanks on the property. Property is located at 19 Rigby Road and will utilize existing frontage. Property is located within the Industrial I zoning district. The Planning Board has reviewed in the application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design of the site plan adequately addresses the site plan review and zoning ordinance requirements for site utilization and layout, access, internal vehicular movement, parking, pedestrian ways, landscaping, stormwater management, lighting, architecture, signage, utilities, and storage. Conditions 1. Prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall revise the plan set to include A. Additional deciduous trees within the areas identified as landscape areas as noted in the staff review memo dated 91420 and discussed with the planning board. B, updated light fixtures that meet lighting standards set forth in the site plan review ordinance. C, snow storage areas. D, a plan note indicating that light fixtures on the site will be dimmed at the close of business. E, revisions to the parking matrix to include the number of proposed parking spaces on the site. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Two, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall A, pay the tra traffic impact fees, B, address the traffic peer review comments in the memo from Traffic Solutions dated 8-11-20. C, address the civil peer review comments in the memo from Woodard and Curran dated 8-20-20. Three, prior to the issuance of a signed permit, the applicant shall provide a final signage plan. This shall be reviewed and approved by the Planning Department. Four, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the Planning Department. That is the motion. Second. I have a second. We have any discussion? Hearing none, I will take a vote. Roger Bealey. Yes. Richard DuPerry. Yes. Rachel Hendrickson. Yes. Nick McGee. Yes. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Next item on tonight's agenda is David Beers requests a shoreland zoning review for a stream crossing at Merrill Brook Drive, Assessor's Map R7, Lots 3 and 4, 1. That was a nigh. You ready? Yeah, Jamil. <laughs> <laughs> so this is located in the Merrill, uh, in the existing Firehawk uh, subdivision along Merrill Brook Drive in the RF zoning district. The applicants proposing to construct a new driveway extending west from Merrill Brook Drive and cross Merrill Brook via the installation of an open bottom culvert to provide access to upland areas on the property. In determining the viability of this application, the board must determine if the proposed stream crossing meets the standards set forth in section 15C in the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance. Staff has noted that we understand that other agencies do not require paving the stream crossing, but continue to recommend alternative approaches uh, through the crossing to provide a stable surface as the current design uh, does provide the, current, the potential for sediment and gravels to enter the brook. The applicant should also be prepared to discuss the erosion and sediment control measures that will be utilized uh, during construction. And finally, staff has drafted a motion uh, for the board's consideration this evening. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jamel. For the applicant, uh, who we have here this evening? Uh, Jason Haskell with DM Roma Consulting Engineers. Welcome, Jason. You're on. Oh, and um, uh, yeah, Jason Haskell with DM Roma um, here on behalf of Craig Beers on his proposed uh, stream crossing for his single family house lot on Merrill Brook Drive. Um, the property is located in the rural uh, farming district. It is also located within the stream protection shoreland zoning district associated with Merrill Brook, which flows northerly beneath, in this direction, northerly. Uh, beneath uh, Holmes Road and then continues to run beneath the two subject parcels. Um, Mr. Beers currently owns uh, lot 4I located here on Merrill Brook Drive and has a purchase and sale agreement with the abutter uh, Edna Smith with lot 3. 
Um, just a little lot history. Um, the overall property um, in this area was owned by a Lance Rainey. Um, he started selling portions of his property back in 2002, including a larger portion in 2004 to Diamond Properties, who um, uh, and and through all these lot splits, he retained um, lot 4I, which uh, Mr. Veers currently owns. In 2004, Diamond Properties received planning board approval for the Firehawk subdivision. And um, because uh, using the, the property that he purchased from Rainey, um, since the lot was included the lot was included in the subdivision and since um, was it was part of the overall parcel, it was um, included in the subdivision, uh, indicated as lot 10 on the um, approved Firehawk subdivision, subdivision plan. Um, the owner abutting lot 10, Edna Smith, uh, shown right here, um, had discussions with Mr. Beers on splitting her lot, but wanted to maintain frontage or, or frontage on Holmes Road. So uh, the purchased land that uh, Mr. Beers would buy didn't did not have any legal road frontage. Uh, Mr. Beers discussed uh, the combination of the two lots, lot 10 on the uh, the Firehawk subdivision and the purchased uh, Smith lot on what that would do to the subdivision and it was agreed upon that an amendment to the subdivision um, was needed to allow the combination of the two lots. In 2019, Mr. Beers received amended subdivision approval um, from the plan board allowing for the combination of two lots as a single family lot once the land was purchased from Ms. Smith. The applicant uh, the applicant is proposing um, to construct a driveway to access the Smith lot from Merrill Brook Drive. Um, this will be about a 360 foot long driveway with proposed underground electric and the lot will be uh, serviced by a uh, drilled well and a septic system. Um, the driveway will require the crossing of Merrill Brook, which is the reason why we're here tonight. Um, the proposed crossing is a 15 foot, 10 inch span with a third, three foot, six inch height open uh, with an aluminum box culvert, uh, utilizing the stream smart design standards. Uh, the crossing was designed to flow full in the 25 year storm event and was analyzed in the larger 100 year storm um, to confirm that the culvert would not, uh, the larger storm event would not overtop the road. And there's actually about two feet of separation between the water surface and the top of the uh, driveway. Um, the major stormwater goals for this project was to re reduce any channelized flow generated by the property and the driveway uh, prior to entering the stream. Um, we, would, we tried to provide a vegetative buffer to allow for the reduction of the velocity of any uh, stormwater uh, tributary to the brook. Um, a level spreader was added to the design to collect the majority of the house lot and allowing it, allowing the stormwater to collect and slowly go over the top of the level spreader and into the wooded buffer before actually getting into the stream. Um, other, and then uh, a roof line drip edge is proposed around the, uh, the future house and that will uh, reduce uh, erosion and also provide a level of stormwater treatment before entering the stream. Other erosion control measures are a construction, uh, a stabilized construction entrance, um, a silt fence around uh, around this, uh, any of the land disturbance, uh, permanent uh, stone check dams, 
uh, riprap stabilization and um, items uh, that they'll need to uh, um, follow during construction. Um, we did receive some comments from staff uh, related to the submission. Um, we've added the paved apron at the Merrill Brook Drive intersection, added the underground electric to the profile and additional notes on the plans as requested by town staff. Um, we have been worked, we have gone through and worked with uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, Maine DEP, and uh, Maine Historic Preservation Commission through the, uh, the design process with this. And uh, we were able to get approvals from them with uh, no comments or any additional recommendations. Um, Angela did come up with a, a good comment about the stability of the originally specified gravel road. Um, and the risk of the, uh, potential sediment transport into the uh, into the brook. Um, after discussions with the applicant, uh, we agreed to install three inches of reclaimed asphalt, which will provide a much more stable surface, um, reducing the risk of a lot of sediment coming into the stream. Um, these were uh, these revisions were sent to Angela and Jamel today. Um, so they're obviously not what you have in front of you, but um, we're hoping that uh, uh, the work we did uh, working with the uh, planning staff um, is uh, adequate for final approval tonight. And I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. We do have the opportunity for public comment this evening. If there's anyone at home that wishes to speak on this topic, please use the raise my hand feature on your Zoom app. Nick, I'm not seeing any at this point. Thank you. I'm going to close public comment. Um, anyone on the board have any questions on this one? Rachel? Yeah, actually, I'd, I'd like Angela to um, address, since we don't have in front of us the, the changes that have been made um, that came in today, I'd like Angela to address the question of the, uh, the stable, um, a, a more stable surface on the roadway. Could you talk about that? Sure. Um, I know we originally had asked about um, the limit for pavement along the driveway and they were limiting um, how much pavement they were putting down. It's a pretty long driveway. It's understandable in the cost. Um, but one of the things um, we mentioned to Jason um, was looking at alternatives to that that would provide the same kind of outcome. And I guess that's what I was looking for. And reclaimed material is essentially um, gravel and it binds together and becomes more of a binding surface than a typical gravel surface would. It's going to end up being um, a lasting longer for the applicant to have to, to deal with and maintain. I think it, it's a better product. Um, and so I think in the long run, it will help the environment and actually be a more sustainable for the um, property owner as well. So I'm happy that they um, looked at it and were agreeable to that. So um, staff is good. OK, thank you. That, that was my question. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, Rick or Roger, you all set? I'm all set. I'm all set. Thanks, Roger. All right, with that, I have a motion to approve the stream crossing project titled Merrill Brook Driveway Crossing prepared by DM Roma dated 8-27-20 with the following findings and conditions. Findings, the applicant is proposing to construct a new driveway extending west from Merrill Brook Drive and cross Merrill Brook via the installation of an open bottom culvert to provide access to upland areas. The property is located along Merrill Brook Drive and will utilize existing frontage. The property is located within the rural farming RF and stream protection SP zoning districts. Planning Board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design of the site plan adequately addresses Section 15C of the Shoreland Zoning Ordinance. Conditions 1. Part of the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall revise the plan set to include, ad include, address <coughs> include and address the staff review comments in the memo dated 9-14-20. This shall be reviewed and approved by the Planning Department 
Two, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. Meetings shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor, and has to be coordinated through the planning department. That is the motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second. Any discussion on the board? Seeing none, I'm going to do a roll call vote. Rachel Hendrickson. Yes. Roger Bealey. Yes. Rick Duperry. Yes. Nick McGee. Yes. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Good luck. Thank you. Next item on tonight's agenda is Crossroad Holdings, LLC, request a subdivision amendment for the Innovation District within the Downs, Assessor's Map, U53, Lot 4. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so the applicant here is proposing to combine Lots 8, 9, 13, 27, and half of Lot 14 into one lot. The other half of Lot 14 is proposed to be combined with Lot 26 into one lot. The applicant's also proposing uh, to modify the location of the approved 50-foot private road utility an access right of way uh, within the lot. At this point, staff has no further comments and has provided the board with a draft motion for your consideration. Thanks. Thank you, Jamel. It's a pretty straightforward one, we believe. Uh, Will, you have uh, anything to add for this one? Uh, I believe Dan Bacon is here. I can share the screen. Dan was going to speak to this part of the application. All right. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, yeah, great. Uh, sorry for the delay. Um, yeah, this is a, a simple uh, subdivision amendment to actually merge uh, four and a half lots to accommodate the Pride self-storage facility. Um, and uh, as is expected in the innovation district as larger projects, projects come along. Um, so these are the current six lots uh, that are approved in the second phase of the innovation district. And if Will switches to the next screen, um, it shows the combining of, of those lots to create lot 27, um, which has frontage along innovation way um, and then widens out to, to make up the lots um, behind uh, lot 26. And lot 26 is a combination of a lot and a half to be about uh, 1.4 acres, with lot 27 being about 4.5 acres. Um, and they would share access like other, um, other lots along a private drive and the planned intersection off of Innovation Way. So other than that, the subdivision plan the same is the same um, in that Drainage and access easement is maintained through the site, and I'm sure Will will present how that's maintained when he gets into the to the site plan presentation, which is your next agenda item. So, in order for the site plan to come along, um, you first have to approve the subdivision amendment to enable the the lots the, to accommodate um, their site plan as proposed. Happy to answer any questions if the board has any. <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks, Dan. I'll open this. Uh, this Actually, we have an opportunity for public comment on this item. If you are at home and would like to speak on this, please use the UA's My Hand feature on the Zoom app. We don't have any public comments, so I'm going to close public comments. Uh, anyone on the planning board have any questions or comments on this? Rachel. Yeah, I, I, I simply want to comment that um, the idea of this, the combination of lots, really is in accordance with what was presented to us when we started to look at the innovation district, uh, giving the developer the ability to to combine as uh, customers came forward. So, uh, in my my opinion, this this carries out the. Uh, the reasoning and the intent behind the the plans that we approved um, a year ago. Thanks, Rachel. Roger and Rick, you guys all set? Okay. With that, I'm, all set. You're all set. I'm sorry, Rachel. What was that? Did he say he was all set? Yeah. Okay. 
With that, I move to approve the project titled Third Amended Overall Subdivision Plan proposed by Crossroad Holdings LLC as depicted on the plan set prepared by Goral Palmer dated 82820 with the following findings and conditions. Findings, the proposed third amended subdivision plan includes the combinations of lots 8, 9, 13, 27, and half of 14 into one lot. The other half of lot 14 is proposed to be combined with lot 26 into one lot. The proposal also includes a modification to the location of the approved 50 foot wide private road utility and access right away, as well as the 24 foot wide access easement within the modified lots. The subdivision is located within the Crossroads Plan Development CPD Zoning District and is further identified on the Town of Scarborough tax maps as map U53 lot 4. Conditions 1. The existing conditions from the July 22, 2019 Planning Board subdivision approval will remain in effect. That is the motion. Do I have a second? Second. Do I have a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll roll call it. Rachel Hendrickson? Yes. Roger Bealey? Yes. Rick DePerry? <clears throat> Yes. Nick McGee, yes. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thanks, Stan. <clears throat> Next item on the tonight's agenda is uh, AEY LLC requests a site plan amendment for 40 Manson. Did I skip one? I skipped one. So too many check marks. <laughs> Michael Pride requests a site plan review for lot 27 within the Innovation District subdivision within the Downs Assessors Map U53 lots 8, 9, 13, and 27. Jamel. Good save. <laughs> <laughs> what? So the applicant's proposing to construct uh, four climate controlled self storage buildings and six traditional self storage buildings on the property. Uh, the project is located on the, I guess, newly approved modified lot 27 within the Innovation District subdivision. Uh, staff would like to note that the applicant is proposing to utilize uh, trips originally set aside for the proposal on lot 6 within the subdivision uh, from the approved main DOT traffic movement permit for this project. Uh, the town's traffic consultant has verified in an email uh, to staff and the board that the proposal to trade the permitted trips uh, is, is adequate. This email can be found in the project's Dropbox folder. Staff has continued to raise concerns related to the proposed illumination levels for the project and has recommended additional reductions uh, to meet the site plan standards, including the overall maximum and minimum range of foot candles on the site, as, they appear to be, as there appear to be deviations uh, in the light and dark levels. Staff has also continued to recommend additional bu buffering and planting provisions along the southerly uh, property boundary to ensure adequate separation of uses between this and lot uh, 26. So the applicant should be prepared to discuss this this evening. In regards to the proposed uh, parking on the site, parking spaces uh, shall not be provided for each unit, but the site shall be designed so that vehicles of customers uh, may stand temporarily in the aisle adjacent to the storage units. So the applicant's proposing seven parking spaces uh, for customers and two spaces for the 466 square foot of office space within, I believe it's building one. Um, at this point, uh, it's no further comments and staff has drafted a motion for the board's consideration uh, with conditions. Thank you. Thanks, Jamel. And for the applicant, we have, uh, we have Will and Sam. Y yep, I believe Mike Pride is gonna open it up. Uh, yes, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Michael Pride. Thank you for allowing me to come before you tonight for your consideration of my proposed self-storage facility within the Innovation District at the Downs. A little bit about me, I'm a retired Chief Engineer from the U.S. Merchant Marines, uh, but to end that career I owned, uh, managed and improved a number of commercial properties. Currently, I'm the owner-operator um, of two self-storage facilities, one of which is um, on Gorham Road in Scarborough. I can say with conviction that I'm a fan of Scarborough and I applaud, applaud the town and the developers for their shared vision in creating the Downs, which I see as a first class project and one that I'm both excited <clears throat> about and sincerely hope to be a part of. My proposed project to the Downs, um, and I hope you agree, will be innovative and that it will include a solar panel component the ability for contact-free rentals, all single-story buildings with drive-up units, a diverse mix of sizes in both temperature-controlled and traditional storage units. I know firsthand that self-storage demand in Scarborough is strong, and I've learned at my other facilities that most of my customers come from within a three-mile radius of the facility, meaning that it serves the immediate community in which it's placed. 
My customers are wide ranging and they include retirees, home buyers, home sellers, and homeowners, apartment renters, contractors, small business owners, and traveling professionals. As such, I feel that this project will serve as an amenity to the Downs and the surrounding community of Scarborough. With this said, please allow me to introduce members of my development team, Will Savage um, from Acorn, Ryan Senator, and Mike Barton. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to the team and they'll give you more details of the project. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Mike. Will Savage here from Acorn Engineering. As Mike said, with us here tonight, uh, Mike Pride with Pride uh, Storage Solutions. Mike Barn is the owner's rep and also has extensive self-storage experience. Uh, Ryan, Ryan Senator, I believe, is um, not quite a participant yet. If he can be let in, uh, Sam LaBelle from Acorn Engineering, project engineer, who uh, right right hand man who helped me out with the application, and then uh, Dan Bacon, of course, from MNR. So originally this project was was up for the board on August 24th. Uh, we missed the 10 o'clock p.m. cutoff, so we used the additional time to answer outstanding comments from the staff. The, the existing project as uh, on the prior agenda item, um, the project involves the creation of a 4.53 acre parcel known as lot 27. Um, consisting of lots 8, 9, 13, and, and 27, and half of lot 14 within the Scarborough Downs Innovation District. Um, appreciate you uh, approving that project immediately prior to this. Uh, surrounding uses to the north is the large uh, amount of open space that you have. To the east is lot 20, is the now um, combined lot 26. Um, to the south, Innovation Way, of course, and to the west, you have AV Tech, and then the uh, incubator space on, on Lot 7. Um, so moving along, the proposal includes 333 traditional self-storage units, as well as 227 climate-controlled units uh, for self-storage. You know, really we're seeing that the, the goal of these self-storage units is, is it goes hand in hand as as houses and as uh, residential rental units become smaller, the self-storage units really help and assist with the right sizing of our of our residential homes and and rental units. It it provides a space for the residences to to store their additional goods um, while not um, you know taking up uh, space at at their home. Um, so we're seeing this more and more throughout the throughout the community. Um, Ryan Senator can discuss the required fenestration um, in accordance with the Innovation District character-based design guidelines. Uh, regarding the the parking, the parking count was derived using the fifth edition of the Institute of Traffic Engineers manual, based upon a parking count, and and this is because the the town doesn't have a specific ordinance that relates to uh, to self storage parking. So. Uh, the ITE manual provides a parking count of 0 0.09 uh, spaces per 1,000 square feet. This is where we came up with a total of seven spaces for the for the self self storage use. Um, we elected to provide a total of nine spaces close to the entrance. So that would be seven for the users of the self storage, and then two additional parking spaces. Uh, for the for the office that would be within building one uh, site access will be of course off of innovation uh, way uh, access to the site will be at one of two secure entrances through a user controlled gate so there's one entrance at the end of the private road as well as a second gate uh, by building one um, both gates will have Knox box control so that the fire department can enter into the enter into the site. Um, regarding overall circulation, extensive uh, coordination uh, with the fire department, we included an auto turn simulation within the within our submittal uh, to the town that depicted a 40 foot long fire truck, uh, 40 foot ladder truck 
moving through the site so that it depicting how it can safely and efficiently uh, move, move through the entire site. In addition, uh, showing how even if there was a car parked um, in one of the outer lanes, how a fire truck could get past. Um, this is, you know, this is something that we put a lot of thought into the overall, really balancing the overall uh, lane widths with so that we didn't have an abundance of impervious area, really trying to balance out where the outer, the outer driveway has a 30 foot wide drive aisle to allow for that circulation of the turn of the fire truck. The outer loops then narrow down to a 28 foot wide drive aisle, anticipating that vehicles will be parked adjacent to the self storage units. So a typical parallel parking space is eight feet wide. 28 minus eight provides that 20 foot wide um, uh, fire access lane so that the fire trucks can get by those parked cars. And then the interior lanes are then narrowed down to 26 feet in, in overall width. So, you know, really looking to, to balance the overall site access uh, with the impervious area uh, that way. So, you know, as, uh, as Jamel mentioned, this, this project does have 19 peak AM trips, 21 peak PM trips during the week, and then 30 uh, peak Saturday trips. Um, this has been uh, balanced out with uh, the allocated trips within the traffic movement permit as uh, provided to you from, from Bill Bray. Overall, with regards to the landscaping, we are proposing a, a high-end black architectural Jareth fence along the entrance. The remainder of the fence will, uh, will also include a black vinyl coated fence anywhere where you don't have, where the building isn't acting as that barrier, we will then have this black coated vinyl fence. Um, as Dan Bacon mentioned, we still have this, this 24 foot wide access way between building seven and six that will provide access back to the stormwater maintenance easement. We have a proposed 20 foot wide uh, access gates to get back to this maintenance easement. Overall, with regards to buffering, we are proposing Eastern White Pines to buffer the, um, the left side of the page is planned north, so the west as well as the east side of the site. Along the private right-of-way, we are proposing Red Maples. And to the south, along Innovation Way, we're proposing a mix of perennials, ornamental grasses, and native, and native shrubs, in addition to the street trees. Regarding utilities, uh, the, they've all been designed in accordance with the respective uh, company's requirements. Power will be underground from the, from the existing pole, servicing the building. Water, we are proposing a eight inch fire main running down the private way to a proposed fire hydrant. You know, that the fire hydrant is required according to uh, the fire department and uh, NFPA regulations. From the eight inch fire main that will be within the private way, we're proposing a six inch fire, la fire line and two inch domestic service to come into the site. Each of the buildings one, two, three, and four are the climate control buildings that will also be fully sprinkled. Um, of course, we, we also have sewer running out to Innovation Way, as well as uh, gas uh, service to the climate control buildings. Um, speaking to the lighting, we are proposing a series of full cutoff wall packs um, along, along the edge of the buildings uh, to provide a safe and functional access to the self storage while keeping the overall site's illumination levels at a, at a modest level. If the board finds it acceptable, uh, we would ask that a potential um, condition of approval would be to provide a revised photometric plan that meets the, uh, the, the board and the staff's uh, approval. I'm happy to discuss that further with any board comments. Uh, regarding the drainage, um, 
you know, as kind of previously highlighted, this highlighted the site has been designed in an efficient manner that strategically sites the buildings and provides a balance between adequate uh, customer fire truck circulation and total impervious area. Although the um, the innovation district master plan was designed for for the stormwater to to run to the wet pond, we we're going a step further in providing additional water quality and the benefits. Nearly 50% of the roof area will be directed to drip edge systems that will further attenuate the stormwater and provide for groundwater discharge. In addition, the catch basins will be outfitted with sediment hoods and traps to further provide water quality. Um, in closing, or almost there, uh, you know, overall the grades have been heavily coordinated with the adjacent landowners, um, including lots 20, 28, 12, and seven. Um, when it comes to self-storage, you have these flat, long, linear buildings with with the narrow uh, drive aisles in between. Uh, stormwater is of the utmost importance. So what you end up is a is with a flat um, overall with a flat site um, with adequate drainage in between. So <clears throat> happy to to answer any additional questions, but. We've coordinated extensively the proposed development. We held a pre-app meeting with the planning department, dis discussed extensively with the town engineer, coordinated the plans with Goral Palmer, the overall engineer of record, and the development team. And with that, I will hand it off to Ryan Senator to go over the architecture. I'm, good evening, Ryan Senator here, uh, project architect. Um, I'll kind of quickly go through the building plans as they're mostly similar um, and then look at the, the elevation renderings, which you may be more interested in. Um, here we have building one. Um, and as you can see um, on the roof plan here, uh, we're showing the solar panels. So Mike had mentioned those um, and those face due south. So um, kind of adding to the, uh, you know, uh, the innovative um, innovation district uh, theme we're going for here, the storage. Um, you know, highly efficient, um, you know, uh, energy efficient uh, building and, um, and the solar panels. Um, as you can see here, we I've kind of shaded the plan to show the area of climate uh, controlled uh, storage units. And then the, the uh, areas that aren't shaded are the non climate ones. Um, you can see we have the, the management office uh, in the front uh, uh, corner there, uh, kind of on the street corner. So as you come in the site, uh, you'll be presented with that. We thought that was the most appropriate, most uh, you know, visible location. Um, we do have a few restrooms in there for the uh, customers, and then um, you know, uh, lots of uh, uh, glazing and fenestration on that facade, as it's required for the uh, the district standard of the 50%. Um, and then uh, on the secondary facades, we have the 15% fenestration standard, um, and you'll kind of see that in the renderings. Uh, go ahead, Will. Um, so building two here, again, this, this is a building that has both climate and non-climate storage. Um, so you can kind of see how that's divided up. Um, the roof pitches are uh, a mono slope pitches, again, kind of going with a kind of a modern crisp design to go with the kind of the theme of innovation and, um, you know, really uh, trying to do a really nice, nice looking uh, self storage, um, you know, facility. Uh, go ahead, Will. Uh, building three is um, uh, similar, a little bit deeper building, but again, a mix of the climate and non-climate. Go ahead. Uh, four is similar, a little bit longer, a little narrower. So, you know, the thing with self-storage is you want a little bit of variety. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in so you get to customers. So each of the buildings is a little bit different. Uh, go ahead, Will. Um, and then, so now we get into buildings five through 10 are all um, uh, non-climate buildings. Uh, but again, just a mix of unit sizes, um, pretty regular door rhythms. So the facades will be nice and ordered, regular. Um, but uh, again, inter in the interior will provide some uh, variety. And you, you can skip through these well, they're all very similar. Um, and so now we get into the, the elevations and here you can see building one um, the elevation on the bottom of the page is the elevation, uh, uh, the primary elevation, if you will. Um, 
going to just pan down. Yeah. So your primary elevation. So you can see we've included a lot of glazing, um, some nice signage, a nice roof pitch detail to really highlight, um, you know, highlight the uh, facility and make it attractive. A nice colored trim uh, highlight detail, a few siding colors to contrast. So really trying to make this uh, really stand out as as not just a storage facility, but some you know nice architecture really add to the district. Um, and as you can see on the uh, I guess we'll call it the, the east elevation is your kind of main entrance. Again, you know a nice nice glazed facade, some uh, different siding patterning. Um, you can see the solar panels on the roof. Um, and really trying to trying to uh, make this a real attractive uh, design. Um, I'm gonna go ahead. Well, you can go down uh, to the next. And then um, so this is building two. So you can see the the slope roof, but they're really you know, the kind of regular pattern of doors. Again, the two colors, the the darker trim color versus the um, the uh, more charcoal uh, um, siding color to give it that uh, level of detail. Uh, go ahead, Paul. And then building three. So here on building three, this faces the secondary uh, road elevation. So again, we've incorporated the uh, the glazing and the trim details um, to really kind of highlight that uh, that corner and facade uh, to really uh, you know make it look attractive. Uh, you can keep going. And then four is similar to three, but again, we four is, is off the street, so it doesn't really have the the um, as much fenestration, if you will. Go ahead. Um, and then uh, five and six are virtually identical buildings. Um, and basically, the, the rest of the buildings are all very similar. Um, they're in the back of the site. Um, but as you as you approach them, you kind of approach them on the narrow end of the building, which is kind of nice. I mean, it, it'll give it good scale uh, from the you know um, the primary road looking down. You'll see you know it's not looking at like one long facade, but you'll be looking at the the numerous buildings and really scale the development. So I think it'll fit nicely in the innovation district. Um, you keep going, Will. So these are just kind of the various um, various different building types, as you can see. Um, and then uh, and building 10. So with that, if, if the board has any questions uh, about the design of the buildings, um, I'm here to answer them. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. <clears throat> uh, you have an opportunity for public comment this evening on this item. If you are at home and like to speak, please use the raise my hand feature on your Zoom app. Seeing no public comment, I will turn discussion back over to the board. Rachel, you want to kick it off? Sure, and I'm going to take this off for a little bit. Um, I Absolutely, I, I, I do like the uh, the architecture for uh, self storage. Um, I think it uh, it really um, makes more of long buildings than traditionally one might see uh, with a very long plain building. I, I think you've done a good job there. Where I have some real questions, though, is around traffic circulation within the uh, the lot. So if we could go back uh, and look at the traffic circulation. Yeah, that's, that's the one. Um, right, first of all, how, how do you plan on um, identifying the buildings? Are they going to be numbered, lettered? You know, when somebody comes in, my storage is in building six, uh, and there's a six at the end of the building. Um, what are you, how are you going to be identifying these buildings? Yeah, I don't know if Mike or Ryan, Mike, if you want to yeah. answer that, but cer certainly we can put together a signed package. Yeah, I don't know if Mike's, Mike's still on, but I would imagine we're working on the signed package, but I imagine we would put some sort of signage to identify the buildings. Okay. Um, yeah, my mind's eye would be what's your preference? I mean, it could be either a number or a letter. Um, whatever it's seen is probably more pleasing to the eye. It makes more sense, probably to the customer. Uh, yeah, but we certainly could can do. That. Yeah, th this is a pretty extensive development. I mean, there are a lot of buildings here, uh, so some sort of identification um, is it going to be accessible twenty four hours a day? Yeah, 
you know, it's a secure facility. Um, and what we're, we're planning to do is, is something called the Noki system. So if it, if it were accessed, it would be done. So if, like say through, through your smartphone, it will have a camera system. Um, so it would, you'd have a record of entry and people would have to access it via that system. Uh, though it, the, it will be manned. Um, right now we're looking at the hours like, uh, like nine, nine to six Monday through Friday and like 10 to two on Saturday. Um, but there would be access outside those hours. Um, they could be limited if they needed to be, um, but it will definitely be a secure facility. Yeah, I, I, I understand that. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how, how people are going to be approaching the facility. You know, certainly after they're, they're used to going there, they're going to know what their, mm -hmm. their building is unless it's 2 o'clock in the morning and they're trying to mm -hmm. get something out all of a sudden. And um, if it's too dark, they may be looking for uh, building signs. So I, I, mean, I recommend... I, I think it's a great idea. Um, I have other commercial property. I generally put the, you know, if the address of the building's 222, I'll put a big, I'll put a sign 222. So I think the numbers, like, you know, I didn't want to overwhelm Ryan's design, uh, but I think having the number on the end of each building or you know, like on building three on the corner where you, so you can see it as you come in is a great idea. And you'd want to have it a contrasting color so that it's visible. Um, yeah, I you know some something to identify, especially if um, absolutely, especially if somebody's uh, coming along and realizing that somebody's jimmied the lock on their um, on their storage and telling the police come to building six. Yeah, you yeah. know that that yeah. sort of thing. So yeah. that it identifies uh, it it identifies for for, for uh, security purposes as well. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah, certainly. Um, also, I. Uh, how are you going to stripe the drive areas so people know that they're two-way? I'm assuming they're two-way. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, when you know, when folks get into an area like this, they're not necessarily thinking of oncoming traffic. So they get to the end, they stop at their their facility, they get whatever they've got to get. Uh, put it back in. They drive to the end of the building. Um, unless somebody says this is a stop, they're not going to think about that. Uh, so there are some real safety issues, I think, in terms of giving the number of, of buildings that you have and the number of spaces. Uh, you need to be cognizant of the fact that not everybody is going to be safety conscious while they're in there. So what sort of um, signs are you going to have, a striping are you going to have at the end of each of these buildings to remind people to stop and take a look and see what's coming at them before they head, uh, before they try to head out of the facility? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we could certainly stripe a, a stop bar at the end of the at the end of the buildings that way. Uh, these are low volume, uh, low turnover units. So, you know, we, we provided that the peak trips for the overall entire facility, but, um, you know, it, but I think it, it's a good point that we could, we could stripe the ends of the driveway just as a visual notification that this is the end of the building and you should look both ways before pulling forward. Okay. Uh, yes, I, I uh, especially on um, Saturday when a lot of people uh, might be out of work and more inclined to be showing up there to get something or drop something off. So there are going to be heavier traffic times, but it's just as dangerous in a light traffic time because people don't expect another car to be coming. Uh, but that's when accidents happen. Um, let me talk about the landscaping along Innovation Way. Um, we do ask that uh, where there is parking that there also be some landscaping to kind of um, up to three feet high, tall uh, or mm -hmm. a berm so that the parking, the cars are 
hidden from the road. Uh, they can't be completely obscured, but we do ask uh, usually for more landscaping there. And while you have the three street trees, I don't see anything on that larger green area. Do you have something yeah, sorry, there? Sorry, it, it, this is a simplified, simplified plan that we've uh, provided for this presentation, but within the, the planning board packet, um, as many of you may know, Aceto Landscaping uh, did the landscape design um, the within their landscape plan there there is a, a heavy amount of uh, landscaping between uh, innovation way and the four parking spaces that we have so there's a, a mixture of of shrubs ornamental grasses as well as as two trees um, that one tree will be here another tree will be here and then a, a mixture of, of medium and, and low um, low height vegetation. Could you uh, direct me to where that is in the packet? Yep. Um, so it's it's after Acorns sheet C ten within the within the plan set. So L1? L L1, yep. Okay, yeah, I, I think that I think that does it. Um, I know Nick is a good landscape architecture architect. And now that I can see that, um, I'm satisfied with that. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. <clears throat> Roger or Rick? Um, this is Rick. I can go. I just have a couple questions. Um, I have the packet in front of me, and I was just wondering, is there a page that shows the snow storage yep, for this it, facility? It shows up on C10. C10. Is, is the snow storage, and it's a it's the cloud hatch that you can see around the perimeter. But sorry, happy you, to happy to speak C, to. Did you say C is in Charlie or E is in Edward? C C is in Charlie. So C it's uh, electronically, it's on page four of the of the civil drawing set. And then I can, if it's easier, I can highlight on the screen the some of the snow storage areas. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at C one, C two. Um, I just don't see C10, but I'm sure it's yep. should be the next, the next one. Maybe you could just show, so could you just sure. speak to where it is maybe? Yep, yep. So at the end of buildings four, five, and six within with this within this area, um, this green area, we have an extensive location for snow storage. Um, we This was a, a big point of discussion during the design. You know, originally we had the um, the solid waste storage within the center of the dry aisle. We pushed that off to the side just to free up more snow storage at the end of the dry aisle. Mm -hmm. Building 10 used to go the full extent of the of the side dry aisle. It used to be much longer. And so we actually worked with Mike Pride to pull that building in. So once again, when you're when you're plowing, you're pushing forward, you would have additional snow storage areas at the end of the drive aisles here, as well as here. You would have opportunities for snow storage along the fence line, not certainly not within the the drainage easement access gates. Um, there's also some some opportunities for snow storage adjacent to Building One. We've we've also included a note on the on the C10 site plan. Right now, this this fence is proposed to be at the top of the slope because we don't quite know what the final edge condition is going to be for lot 26. So we're so right now the top of the fence is at the top of the slope. We are then sloping down to match in at the property line. Um, we're anticipating that when lot 26 comes along and and builds, they're going to raise the grades. 
So, um, you know, once we know what that final edge condition is, this fence could slide over further and go onto the property line, thereby freeing up a little bit more space for snow storage. So, okay. um, you know, we've looked for any and all opportunities for snow storage off the pavement so that it does not impact the fire access lanes or parking on site. You know, should should there be a, a big winter, much like many users within um, within our area, that there may need to be some snow that's trucked off site. But okay. you know, we've provided opportunities on on site for the snow storage. Okay, and I'm sure I think Mike mentioned this isn't his first big storage job, right? I mean, it's, you've, we've got you've got these other places, so I'm sure you thought about stuff like that um and then just could you uh just brief me um uh, on the photometrics um yep do you have uh, are the lighting like in between the buildings on sensors or does each unit have a a light outside of it when you open up the i'm assuming these are like sliding you know kind of like garage doors that that go up and that kind of go up right and when when the door goes up does the light go on or and this is more not from a just a plant just from a kind of like a safety how the lighting works mike do you want to address the interior and i can address the exterior so for at my other facilities we we don't we do not have interior lighting um at those facilities what i've done with people is um, provide like a battery operated LED uh, fixture. You know, if they want one, most people don't come at nighttime. So there's very yeah. few that would want to utilize that and, and they use that. This facility, I'm wor still working with the, with the um, electricians and trying to decide, generally it's recommended on the bigger, and when you say uh, garage doors, they're a little different because they're roll up doors. So as they roll up, they, they spin up. Yeah. They'll have yep. the overhead uh, within the space to store your contents up high. Um, but my, in my mind's eye, being innovative, I, I would like to provide more many, especially with the larger units. Like the small units, the like the 5x10s, it, it probably is generally not needed. But maybe the bigger ones, and the biggest one is around 300 square feet, uh, w which might have a little bit wider door to it. Yeah, it'd be nice to... Um, put a light in there and I, I probably would put it on a motion sensor because otherwise it'd be left on and then that would be, you know, wasteful. Um, right. So, oh, so yeah, I jump in here, Mike, Mike, if you want me to. Yep. Uh, so this is Mike Barden, the owner's rep, uh, working with the team here. Uh, so the climate control units, the, the interior areas are, are on occupancy sensors. So, we have the technology on the site. Uh, the I idea for the site uh, exterior lighting was uh, more either time of day clock or photo cell. Uh, but because we do have the technology with the occupancy sensing, we, we could look to uh, provide minimum light levels um, and then occupancy, occupancy sensor, um, you know, for en enhanced light levels if there is someone who does come to the site. Right. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't really have anything to do, uh, not not anything, but I mean, it's not a condition of approval or anything like that, of course. But where you mentioned earlier that these are going to, the need for storage is, is a lot of people downsizing or changing houses or in between houses. And, you know, it never fails. Nine o'clock at night, you realize, oh, crap, that's in storage and you got to go get it. So um, it's just a thought, really. So... And you said the uh, the out the the lighting for like the parking lots and stuff. That's um, is there a photo? Is there a the, see, is there a photometric plan I should be looking at? Sorry. There there is a, a photometric plan um, that was submitted within within the packet. I, again, though, I can, I can talk to it on on the screen here. Um, so the shorter buildings, eight, nine, and ten. They have uh, three building, one, two, three building mounted, uh, full cutoff light packs. Once you get into the slightly longer building, seven, six, five, four, 
they have four uh, building mounted lights. Um, you know, I think something that we could look at working with staff, do we, do we go from three building mounted to four and then we can reduce slightly the illumination levels? I believe what the staff was picking up in their comment was that we have some hot, hot spots and then darker areas adjacent to. So certainly we want, you know, a more even spread for the photometric plan. We took two wax at it, happy to go back to, uh, to our photometric designer and, and tell them, you know, we, we got to improve this further. Um, uh, as to Mike's point, these, these units as that we provided and submitted, they do have the they do have the option to have dust to dawn control. Um, they also have the opportunity for that occupancy sensor with dimming control so that, you know, you could have these dry vials lightly lit to for security, but then somebody drives in and it, it illuminates. Um, you, know, you see that a lot in buildings and that's something we could look at for, for the dry vials. Um, you know, right now that the Calvin is at 4,000, Possibly that could be reduced to 3,000 is the lower limit, 5,000 is the upper. So this is right, right smack dab in the middle. Yep. Okay. And then just lastly, is there, is there like a chain link fence around this whole facility? Or there is a, there is a chain link fence. Um, for the majority, we um, a, a portion the the most visible part from Innovation Way. Um, you will look down the private drive aisle and see a um, the black architectural Jareth fence. Uh, that's okay. a you know it's a pleasant looking fence that, that we use um, extensively in historic zones. Um, okay. And then the, the remainder of the fence would be black vinyl coated, which certainly vinyl coated is much more expensive than just your traditional. Uh, um, Fence. Yeah, I, I think it's a nice touch for this area. It's kind of like a classic storage place rather than just your normal storage place. So I think you did a really good job with it. I, I think it looks good. Thanks. Thank Thanks, Rick. <clears throat> Roger, do you have anything, Dad? Yeah, yeah, just a um, couple of questions about the architecture. Uh, just kind of curious. Um, on building one, uh, the the um, the glazing is mo uh, most is most of that glazing basically um, non-functional glazing. In other words, you don't see through anything; it's just there. I uh, know you you see through it. Oh, you do. So, yeah. so this, for instance, on that bottom. Sorry. Yeah, that bottom one there. That, that that's actually a storage facilities right behind those that glazing. There's a, there, we built in, intentionally built in a little corridor. So you see depth, you know, you're not just looking at a, a flat wall. So, yeah. Okay. And um, then when I was looking at, for instance, building two, is that um, the bottom um, image? That's just strictly a blank wall, is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's actually the boundary of the property. So that's, that's kind of the that bounds an interior lot line of another lot basically so it doesn't face any street i, I gotta go back and look at this so will if you want to go up to the site plan so i got it right here building two yeah so building okay. yeah so build, we got a bunch you know the pine trees are um mm -hmm. uh, up against that yeah so building two yeah. The, you have the roll-up doors, which would be in the fire lane. Is that correct? Correct. And the and the blank wall would be against that private way. This is uh, the private property line. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Then then, then uh, when I'm going to um, here we go buildings. Um, I think it's buildings. Five through nine. Yeah. Do you have the roll-up doors on both sides of those buildings? Correct. Yeah. 
That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I guess, I guess the only other question I have, I, I think you've done a good job. I, I, I'm amazed at, at the demand for all the storage. <laughs> uh, but um, on, on the uh, south side of lots seven through nine, where, or seven through 10 or seven through nine, I guess, where you have the fence, staff had recommended having some uh, buffering, some uh, plantings or something. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? I, I guess we were looking to hear that the board's concern. Certainly lot 26 has not uh, yet been developed. Um, yeah. So I guess we were looking for, for the board's input. Well, what we, what we did previously in a situation similar to this, uh, it was with lot 29, if, I'm not mis if I recall correctly, there was a question about um, the back, the back uh, boundary of that which would be the back boundary of lot 26. And I think there was some sort of an arrangement or a condition made to coordinate with whoever buys that property. Uh, maybe staff could comment on that. Uh, yeah, from what I recall, the lot 20, lot 29, which I believe is the throttle club, is that what you're referring to? Yes, yes. They just planted a row of, of trees um, at the edge of their property. That's what they did. So, so, um, so would staff be? Uh, I know, I know, it's in your your notes. Uh, would staff prefer to have some trees planted there? Um, because apparently the um, the the landscape architect has also got the uh, smaller smaller shrubs around some of the other properties. Uh, so staff was just stating the ordinance. Uh, typically, they. Ordinance looks to separate uses, whether it's through plantings or fence. So that's a board decision. And we were just noting uh, the buffering standards in the site plan ordinance. Yeah. But it seems to me that if, so, you know, I don't have it, obviously we don't know it's going to be going in 26, but they may not prefer to be looking at storage facilities as, you know, I think that, I think you might want to consider doing something yeah, that, but and, I'm not and, sure if this is the appropriate time to do it, you know? And I, I think we're open to providing, say, three, you know, three eastern white pines and almost sharing so that if we provide three, then possibly when lot 26 comes in, they'll provide an additional three just to increase the, the buffer density. I, I can speak to that on behalf of Crossroads. Um, that I think that's that would work for us. I also remember, Will, you presented that potentially once grades are set on lot 26, you may shift the fence to the property line to provide that screening and give you some additional um, snow storage area. So, yeah. um, you know, if that, if grades are set, you know, during construction or when there's still time to make the adjustment to the fence, that may be best for you from a snow snow storage standpoint and still provide that buffer to a lot 26. Mm -hmm. I, I know, I know the, um, the landscaping has been uh, coordinated very nicely between all the properties so far. So I have um, a lot of confidence that'll be continued. So um, I think you worked that out. Um, I think that's that's all I have. Thanks, Roger. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, for our board members, I had a, a copy of the motion at hand. Uh, item condition C says additional buffering provisions along the southern property boundary, directly south of Building Seven through Ten, is an item in there. Um, <clears throat> I think between the applicant and maybe some staff and uh, whether or not uh, Dan can be involved in something like that. I think providing that to uh, staff, I don't think we should, I don't know if we need to pick out plants tonight, but I think that could probably de be developed and, and issued there. Um, and since you have chain link, I'm just gonna throw it out there. How about some ivy? I don't know, this might, whatever. It's like I said, I'm not gonna plant it tonight. So um, I don't have a whole lot to add to the discussion other than I think you did a wonderful job with 
storage facility. Uh, those can be bland, boring, you know, kind of drab buildings. And I think you've done a nice job uh, kind of bringing them to life a little bit and appreciate those efforts, especially um, when it comes to not just the fenestration, but the, the willingness to work with lighting and numbering and, and uh, traffic flow and, and things of those nature. So well done. Uh, that said, Nick, I, yes. Nick, yes. Um, I, I just want to correct something that you just stated. I don't think it's a chain link fence. I think it's a pretty decorative fence they have going around. I think it's a it, black, it, black it, vinyl is what I recall, but is that? Yeah, it's a it's a called a typical Jareth industrial fence. It's not a chain link. Is that is that correct it, to the applicant? It, it's a combination. It's it's the Jareth at the entrance. So at the end of the private road, you'll see the Jareth fence, which oh. is what what will be visible from Innovation Way. But then the remainder would be the the black vinyl fence. Oh, okay. I'm looking at C41, and underneath the um, the decorative fence, that's where I'm getting the wording. Yep. Yeah, so that, that will be used for uh, the most visible component, fence component from Innovation Way, but it will not bound the entire site with, with the okay. Jareth. Is that, would that be going right there along uh, uh, Lot 26? For a portion of it, but not the entire stretch. Okay. It, it's still a, a permeable fence as well. It's not as if uh, it's a, uh, a stockade fence. Yeah, no, I understand. Okay. All right. <clears throat> that said, I have a motion here. I'm going to clear my throat real quick. <clears throat> All right. I move to approve the site plan project titled Innovation District Self Storage Facility as depicted on the plan set prepared by Acorn Engineering, Inc., dated 83120, with the following findings and conditions. Findings The applicant is proposing to construct four climate controlled self-storage buildings and six traditional self-storage buildings totaling 76,650 of total building square footage on the property. The property is located on lot 27 within the Innovation District subdivision and is within the Crossroads Plan Development CPD Zoning District. Planning Board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design of the site plan adequately addresses the site plan review, zoning ordinance, and the Innovation District regulating plan requirements for site utilization and layout, access, internal vehicular movement, parking, pedestrian ways, landscaping, stormwater management, lighting, architecture, signage, utilities, and storage. Conditions 1. Prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall revise the plan set to include A. Reduce lighting levels on the site as noted in the staff review memorandum dated 9-14-20. B, a revised plan note on the site plan indicating a specific time when the lights will be dimmed on site. C, additional buffering provisions along the southern property boundary, directly south of buildings 7 through 10. D, revised building elevations that include the correct orientations. E, individual building elevations and floor plans for buildings 5 through 10. F, a plan note referring to the most recent recorded subdivision plan with recording information for the innovation district. G, additional pavement and sign, um, additional pavement markings and signs throughout the site to ensure safety, safe two-way travel as discussed with the planning board. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Two, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall A, pay the traffic impact fees. B, provide approval by the Portland Water District. C, provide approval by the Scarborough Sanitary District. D, coordinate with the police department in regards to addressing the proposed buildings. Can you clarify that last one for me, Jamel, real quick? Uh, sure. Since there's multiple buildings on the property, the police department typically likes to work with the applicant to uh, address the buildings appropriately. This would also get at um, Rachel's concerns for signage and how customers could identify the buildings. Okay. Thank you. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Three, prior to the issuance of a signed permit, the applicant shall provide the final signage plan. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Four, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. That is the motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, uh, Rachel Hendrickson? Yes. Roger Beely? Yes. Richard Duperry. Yes. 
Nick McGee says yes. Congratulations. Good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. A little administrative note, this is going to be our last item for the evening, so if you have been waiting, we apologize. Uh, item 12, AEY LLC, request a site plan amendment for 40 Manson Libby Road, Assessor's Map R62, Lot 22. Jim Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so this is the industrial zoning district located on the corner of Manson Libby Road and Washington Avenue. So the applicant was last before you uh, in July. Uh, since then, the applicant has actually eliminated the second full access driveway once proposed along Manson Libby Road. So the applicant's proposing to renovate the existing building on the property for new tenants. According to their narrative, the proposal includes approximately 11,490 square feet for non-municipal government offices and 4,510 square feet of professional office space. So the zoning ordinance allows the board uh, to determine the minimum parking requirements for any land use that is not specifically noted uh, in the ordinance. This determination shall be based on the nature and intensity of the proposed use, along with the expected parking demand uh, for the proposal. So the applicant should be prepared to discuss these criteria with the board to, to help enable a determination of the off-street uh, parking requirements. As requested, the applicant has provided additional plantings along the Manson Libby Road and Washington Avenue frontages uh, for screening purposes. Staff has recommended uh, additional plantings adjacent to the street corner to further screen the proposed parking area on the site. At this point, I'll ask Angela to uh, talk about some of the stormwater management uh, comments that we identified. Forget to turn that on. Um, one of the things the board um, usually considers is meeting pre-development um, stormwater runoff flows. Um, we try to meet, be at or below pre-existing conditions. As you will know in Woodard and Kern's memo, this site is um, above the pre-development conditions as far as uh, peak flow rates. And... Um, it was also noticed, noted that that is insignificant. I have further reached out just to verify with Public Works, um, looking at this site does discharge to our public roadway system and the ditch lines through there. I know the, um, I found out from Public Works that the culvert crossing um, at that intersection that this discharges to was recently, um, I'll say recently in the past few years, was upgraded. Um, and replaced, so that is good news probably for the applicant, um, and that it does have capacity. Um, I will just note that um, this is really something the board just needs to consider. Um, we have tended to err on the side of sticking with um, this policy, I guess, but for lack of a better term, um, just because of in the past we've had downstream abutters um, that we deal with that any type of increase, whether insignificant or an extra drop of water in their basement is significant to somebody else. Um, this, however, I will note is um, discharging to a tidal portion of the marsh, um, but I just wanna make sure that the board is aware that if, um, this is a change, I guess, in the typical way the planning board looks at it, if we um, did allow kind of this, it's not, it's not a formal waiver, but um, it's outside of the norm that the, the planning board looks at um, when they deal with stormwater. So I just want to make sure that you guys are making a conscious decision on how that moves forward. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Angela. Mm -hmm. With that, Mr. Anderson. Yeah, and you have uh, Scott Anderson and Josh Sh Soley here um, with the board, um, but I'm going to kick it right back to Matt and Paul, who are going to run the board through changes um, that we've made uh, since the last uh, meeting with the board. Also, since we received Jamel's comments, we have been incorporating some of those changes into the plan um, as well um, and are um, eager to walk through um, your kind of assessment of the parking and any other uh, comments or questions that you have. Um, with, uh, as with all applicants, we are 
eager to stay on our timing track. Um, so if you are in a position tonight where you feel like you're comfortable with the project, where you've been able to address parking and stormwater and these other items, uh, we would, of course, uh, very much appreciate entertaining a uh, possible final decision tonight. But I'm going to turn that over to Matt and Paul, who are going to wow you and put you in exactly that mindset before we depart this evening. So thanks, everyone, for your attention. Thank you. All right, thanks, Scott, for that uh, astounding uh, introduction. Uh, I'm Matt Ward. I'm a principal and an architect at WBRC. Uh, Paul's with us. He's a civil engineer on the project. I'm going to start off the uh, presentation. I'll, I'll share my screen here just a second. All right. So. Uh, based on our comments from our last meeting, we've gone back to the table, uh, we've, we've looked at parking, uh, we've looked at our buffering, um, and I guess I'd like to start with uh, how, how the project goes. We've eliminated the second entrance altogether, um, so we're coming in the existing entrance that is currently there, and we're maintaining the existing flow of traffic around the entire building uh, and still maintaining a fire access. Uh, we have verified with turning radiuses that they can get the biggest truck that runs with uh, that Scarborough has uh, a ladder truck around. Uh, so there's there's no issues with the, 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 the fire truck making its route. Uh, we've also added a buffer between the parking lot and the building, as you can see in the screen space, uh, to kind of give some separation. Uh, I think the last one, the sidewalk was right up against the building. Then we've also introduced, uh, you know, some plantings along the, the perimeter edge of the site. Uh, it was noted in the staff comments that uh, this intersection right here uh, should have some additional buffering. So we have since gone in and added these uh, three uh, plantings. Um, uh, as far as parking, let's see what my order is here. The first item that you guys had was parking, right? And how the building was related. So we've since gone back to the tenants of the buildings um, and determined the number of, of spots uh, that you know they require versus the number of spots that are in the ordinance. Uh, as you can see from this table, we've outlined the area and the, and the, and the layout of the building as requested at the previous uh, planning board meeting. Um, you know, um, so in our site table, this is kind of a snip image from the site table. And can you guys see this all right? Yes, we can. Yes. Uh, so based on a business use uh, or an office use or a dentist use or a medical office use, uh, in general, that's four uh, spaces per thousand square feet of building area, which equates to 64 spaces minimum. Uh, at the last meeting, uh, there was concern with um, the DHS project, which is tenant one on the use um, and the uh, number of spaces that they would need to be able to function, as well as uh, tenant three, uh, the GSA vet clinic on what goes on in that space, the number of visits, uh, the number of parking for visitors that are overlapping. Uh, so we have since gone in and we, we questioned our, our client, uh, well, the end users on what their parking needs would be in their operation hours and such. So tenant one, uh, which is uh, the DHS facility, um, has a full-time equivalent of 12 staff uh, in the building. Their parking is, is, is uh, currently located within the fence area of the project. Uh, and then, you know, there's, there's visiting hours um, and we could anticipate a maximum of two to three visits per an hour. Uh, based on the waiting room layout, based on the office space, based on the, the area where people can actually come in and, 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 and speak with people that are working there. Uh, so based on that um, requirement, uh, you know, they're looking to have 14 spaces uh, and we're providing them with uh, more than 14, I think. And the ordinance would require 24. So at any one time, there could be 12 full-time employees and two visitors on site at a time. Um, tenant space two, we're not really working with them. Uh, we just gave them their four per thousand at 18. And then tenant space three, which is the vet clinic. Um, there are uh, seven full-time employees of which um, 
there's an office uh, secretary, there's a director, and there's four counselor rooms um, or five counselor rooms. So we can anticipate five visits per an hour. Uh, and that's the max that they would anticipate coming in. Um, and that equates to uh, people there at any one time of maximum of 12 called vehicles with five of those vehicles. Uh, well, actually, five of those vehicles would be overlapping. So it's a total of um, 10 visitors at a time as you're coming and as you're going and seven full-time employees. Um, so that's 17 total parking spaces for them. Um, so anyway, spaces needed versus uh, the ordinance. Uh, the ordinance is requiring 64 for four per thousand. Um, you know, we're able to provide 61, which is above the minimum spaces needed based on the occupants' um, trip, daily trips. Um, as we get into the buffering, uh, I think I kind of touched on that uh, based on the comments that we received uh, yesterday or Friday. Uh, you know, they, they requested that we, you know, add these additional three buffer spaces, but with met the, well, we believe we've met the intent of the buffering ordinance uh, for the town of Scarborough. Uh, so we've added that planting in the corner. Um, and just to add to Matt's, you know, we're, we've got both the trees and the 36 inch high buffering uh, that were, was discussed at the last um, uh, planning board meeting. Uh, along with the additional plantings that Jamal had suggested in his comments. Right, so this is the big one with stormwater uh, and um, flow rates and whatnot. So for the two year storm, uh, we're better than what was originally there with the filters and whatnot. For the 10 year storms, we're slightly better. And then for the 25 year storm and the 50 year storm, we're slightly uh, increasing the amount of offflow, but it's really negligible at point uh, 8% and 0.5% uh, increase for those two items. Um, I guess that's yeah. That's what yeah. That's what we want to stress is um, you know we we have looked at multiple storms. Uh, I'm not even sure the 50 year storm is one of the storms that's <clears throat> required in this particular area. That's typically reserved for DOT type projects. But long story short, all of these flows in cubic feet per second at peak flow rates is less than 1% for the 25 and 50 year storm. The two and 10 year storm are the ones you see more frequently, obviously, and we have reduced the flow for those. So um, at some point, you know, it, it's at or less, and we feel as though 1% or less is, is really at what it was previously. When you look at the total number, 8.86 versus 8.93, and that difference is, um, less than a tenth of a cubic foot per second for that 25 year storm. So, um, and that's what we went with and that's what we were looking at. Um, so we, we hope that you can look at that favorably and that the impacts will not be in fact, um, viewed downstream from this project. So. Um, parking areas, um, you had requested uh, additional directional signage and uh, we are fine with adding that additional directional signage as well as the do not enter sign um, so that folks don't decide to take a left once they uh, enter the parking lot. Uh, take no exception to that request from the town. Uh, and here are the directional signage that we've added to get us around the building on the pavement of parking lot. Uh, lighting, uh, I believe we included uh, a cut sheet in our package. Uh, in that package, uh, it should have been provided the height that was on the pole. Uh, it's a full cutoff fixture. Uh, the, the lights are on a timer uh, that is adjustable depending on the hours of operation. So we're assuming they'll be on, you know, 7 to 8 a.m. in the morning and 5 to 6 p.m. at night, depending on on, on light, or they'd be, they'd be turned on or, or, or and shut off, uh, so not to be on throughout the whole evening. 
although we are an industrial zone, um, it won't affect uh, anybody sleeping in their houses, hopefully. Uh, but here's a, a cut sheet of the, the light fixture. This is the head, it's at the top of the pole. Uh, these are the different uh, identified uh, specifications of the lights highlighted in yellow. Uh, we've included the pole in there as well. It's a 20 foot high pole. Um, more information about the pole. I believe this is all in the application, right, Paul? That's right. Yep. The This one is not, though. The wooden dumpster detail is something that's additional that was asked just on Friday. And so we, um, we do have a proposed uh, stockade fence around the dumpster. Uh, we did not have a detail that showed that and one was requested. So this would be the detail for that. Um, just typical fencing, wood stockade. Um, this is a, this particular one is a shadow weave. I'm not sure right now, it's just a typical stockade out there and we'll probably match what's actually out there for that. But, um, you know, the posts are six foot tall and they are spaced six to eight feet on center. And uh, it's pretty straightforward. And this is just a summary of all the comments received and responses to those comments. So um, in general, we've uh, looked at and addressed all the comments um, that we received on Friday and we don't have any real outstanding issues that we take any sort of issue with and we feel like it's well within reason to comply with those items and make this project meet the requirement for the town and just kind of highlighting two things i know the discussion of parking was a big one at the last meeting and i think as jay had mentioned um, we've got two uses that don't really fit squarely within office and medical dental. We've tried to kind of use those. So when we say that the ordinance requires 64, that would be if we really were doing offices and medical dental, and then it would, it would work. But based on the comments and the questions from the board, what we really did was we went back to the tenants and talked to them specifically about what their needs are. And that's where we came up with the 44 spaces. So we think the 61 is going to give us more than enough to meet the actual needs of these two uses that are a little bit related to, but not exactly like some of the ones on that on that chart. Um, and then on the stormwater piece, appreciating Angela's comments and the board's tradition of making sure that the zero is zero and not 0.8, but we think that um, um, it would be um, uh, acceptable to kind of let things uh, stand where they are now, mostly because we don't think we have downstream recipients. So we appreciate the policy of the board has been to make sure there can be no question that no one downstream would take even the, even the drop in their basement. But um, we're feeling like there won't be any basements receiving any drops. So we ask you to, to, to find that those very, very small increases over pre-dev conditions are acceptable. And uh, I think other than that, anything more from Matt or Paul, um, um, those are the kind of highlights on the new items. And um, also incorporating some of Jamel's comments from his staff memo last week. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, we have an opportunity for public comment on this item. If you were at home and would like to speak, please use the raise my hand feature on your Zoom app. I don't see anyone. Hmm? Okay. With that, I'll close public comment. Um, you know, I appreciate the uh, work and attention you've put into uh, getting this moving forward. I really only got, I think you've highlighted the two major issues here, at least uh, for us. Uh, the parking, I'm actually, I'm okay with. I mean, I think I've sat here plenty of times and said, you know, an applicant usually knows what they need for parking and whether that's a little bit larger or smaller than what the town is recommending. You know, we're talking three spaces. I'm going to I'm going to guess you guys have a good feel of what you need in there. Um, so I'm, I'm relatively comfortable with that request. The request I'm not comfortable with, though, is deviating from the don't make it worse policy. And so my question to you would be, what does it take to get those numbers dropped down? Like, what, what type of additional efforts would have to be made into this plan to get those to pre-construction level and, and post, you know? What would it take? What's the... Uh, 
one of the engineers, I imagine, might. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a couple things we could do. The um, probably the simplest, but again, we'll have to get into the HydroCAD model just to check and see how it how it actually reacts to that. But um, there are roadside ditches along the road, and the first thing you can do is slow down that water flowing off site using stone check dams, which are um, main DEP approved uh, best management practice type of item. So we could look at putting a couple of those into the ditch. Um, Cause really what it comes down to is it's a peak flow issue and slowing it down is the best way to do that. And so the stone check dams would do a number for that. that the sounds, other thing we could real quick, yep. that sounds like a relatively simple, easy kind of fix. If you're this close to the line, is that, am I misunderstanding what that oh, yeah. is? Yeah, no, it is a simple fix. I, I guess I hadn't realized that, um, you know, I, in, in my mind that less than a percent was pretty much equal. And, um, Again, when, when you talk about these storms, the two-year, really the one-year and two-year, the ones that most people get concerned with because you see those at least once or twice, you know, once a year or once every two years, it's those 50-year storms, 25-year storms. Um, you, you don't see those more than once or twice in your lifetime. And when you do, most of the time, all heck breaks loose all over the town, not just at that particular site. But with that said, we were um, less than a percent. So in my mind, it was pretty much equal. But, you know, we can certainly slow it down with um, some stone check dams. The filtera unit is sized um, to treat the water. However, there are options to um, increase that size. Of course, there's cost implications, but um, that would take more water, which would then slow down the water coming out the other side as well. So. Do you think you need both of those mechanisms in place, or is it one of the two, some sort of combination? I mean, I do think, yeah, I think the stone check dams should probably do the trick. Um, but again, running it through the program is what would need to ha happen to just prove that theory. Um, okay. But in in past instances, we have had success using stone check dams. So, okay, and and you know, just I just want you to know where we're coming from, like. It's not a bad rule of thumb. Let's let's not make it worse as we go, right? Um, and we've got a ton of development in this town, and if everyone came in with just a little hair under one percent, that could get mus messy fast. So um, that's that's my position. I am one vote. Um, I'll have my fellow board members just weigh in on those two topics, and then we can deviate into other questions. How's that sound? Can, um, can I just Angela? Go ahead. I guess chime in because um, what we do find is a lot of times people come in with the I, I would say considering this insignificant amount of like you said it's just peak flow rate and really it's a matter of usually something very small like you're talking about I completely agree that if there's something like check dams or something like that just adding something into the model to slow even to not align some of the peaks together is is really the key there and um, the reason why we look at that too is just in Scarborough, we do see um, the 10 year and 25 year storm event. It, it just feels like um, at this point, we hold that line also into the fact that our minimum pipe size requirement is 15 inches rather than 12, which is a lot of time just because we get inundated all over the place. Um, we are in a, a marsh um, and very high groundwater. And so, uh, 10 year storm event, 25 year storm event, we see and feel dramatically. So I think it's important to just kind of consider that. Sure. And, yeah. and I think I mean, we can work that through staff too. I just wanted to add that too, if that's something the yeah. board wanted to consider, because yeah, I think we're that close that we could deal with that with the, with the civil. We do have a draft motion that contains language to that effect. Okay. Um, but um, yeah, I'm glad to hear that it could probably be resolved relatively easy. Uh, Rachel and uh, I'll start with Rachel. Do you want to weigh in on at least on those two topics before we deviate off of those? Um, the second one being the parking. Yes. Okay. Uh, sure. Um, I, as Angela and Nick both said, um, just a little bit from one person and then a little bit from another and a little bit from another, and all of a sudden we have problems, and we've seen that in a couple of areas uh, that where uh, parking, where malls went in, 
uh, and they met the requirements and then somebody built down here and somebody built down here and all of a sudden um, we had a real problem in the stream and I it's something that we just have come to the realization over the past few years that we have to say if this is if this is our principle then this is our principle and in terms of parking I had a couple of questions about it, not necessarily the number. Um, I, I, Get it all at once. Go for it. Okay. <laughs> sure. Uh, and I think somebody said they were going to wow me. I'm waiting. The uh, Sorry, guys. Um, I have a question. What vehicles are going to be in the fenced-in area? Um, We've got parking in there. Passenger cars, you know, employees' vehicles. Excuse me. I, I missed that. Sorry. Employee vehicles. It could be, uh, you know, uh, uh, Camry. Who knows? It's, it's an employee parking. Are there going to be any vehicles there overnight? No. Okay. Now I'm not clear on why you need the fence. Could you explain that? That's a tenant request to have a fenced-in parking secure from the public. A fenced-in parking secure from public? Yes. Um, it's a fascinating answer. Um, let me, uh, let's just keep going with that fenced in area. At the last meeting, I asked you to come back with um, an additional, uh, to take an additional look at how a fire truck would go into, get into that fenced in area and how could they back out? Was that turning radius done? Was that assessment done? Suppose you have a fire in a vehicle in the parked in area, in that fenced in area. How are you gonna get a fire truck into there? And this, the, the, the parking spaces along the perimeter edge of the fence, uh, there would be no need to drive the, the fire truck into that space. They have access to the building on all four sides. Um, I suppose if they wanted to drive a fire truck in, they could, but I, I don't see the need. It's, it's, a, it's a fence that you can put water through uh, and all the parking is on the perimeter edge. You wouldn't want to jeopardize a truck by driving it into the... And, and the building itself, if that was needed for a fire truck. So the, the fence itself cannot be an access used by fire trucks or safety uh, for access we, to the building. We did. We don't know, in other words. I didn't say that it couldn't be, but if a, if a car was on fire in the fence, like the question you asked, the truck would not drive into the fence in the area. I, you're not answering my question. I'm mm -hmm. asking you, can a fire truck go in there? and back out, have you done that turn? Have you done that assessment? Paul, what size fire truck can go into that lot? Yeah, we can get, I mean, it's, it's, a tw it's meeting the standard for everything that the town has, including 25 foot drive aisle. So it should be able to get into that area um, if it ever needed to. And back We out. did contact yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not going to turn around in there, but it's going to go straight in, straight out um, without turning around. And we have floated this plan to the fire department um, for their feedback as requested um, at the last planning board meeting. So um, we have not received any negative comments from the fire department on the plan that we presented them. Did you ask them specifically about the fenced in area? Yes. And their answer was? I can jump in if They're you want. They're fine with the fenced-in area. Excuse me? They are fine. The fenced-in fenced area is acceptable. Okay. Jamel has some context, too. Okay. Yeah, I can just jump in and say that the fire department does review projects um, as part of our staff review process, and they did indicate that they were okay with that design. Okay, that's all I needed. I asked for it last time, and I wanted to make sure I had it this time. Um, I have no further questions about parking. Number of spaces, Rachel, are you okay? I, I think the, uh, um, the tenants usually know best how things work. I have no problem with the 61. Thank you. Roger, can you weigh in on the two topics and then we'll, we'll dive into any other issues? Sure. Um, 
I have uh, no problem with the parking. And um, the other issue is the, um, remind me what, what the second issue is. Is it the- Stormwater. Stormwater. Um, I guess um, it sounds like it's not, a, it's not a significant issue to try and improve that. So I would tend to give them an opportunity to see, see what they could do to, to improve it. I, pertaining to that, if I, could, if I may, and I don't know if this is relevant or not, but on, this, on the staff notes about uh, additional curbing along the northern edge of the pavement area. Is, does that play into this at all, Angela? Uh, what, what is the question? Sorry. Um, in the staff notes, it says, uh, staff continues to recommend that the applicant provide additional curbing along the northern edge of the pavement area to direct more impervious area to the Pilterra opening. <laughs> Um, I think there might be a little misunderstanding of um, maybe with the applicant civil and what I was getting at. Um, it's really about trying to maximize the amount of impervious area that's going to the fill terra system or the, the I don't know if it's fill terra or focal point, the tree filter. Um, and by curbing along that edge as much and extending it down, just using the grades that you have to collect as much water as you can. So that's that was the, the staff comment was trying to get to capture more through there. Um, that won't really address what you're talking about, the Roger, it's, um, he's still gonna have to probably do something downstream or at the structure itself, but it's only, it's, yeah, I'm not sure how that will model out, so. Um, okay. But it would just increase how much area is being treated. That's That was the goal there. I, I guess, um... I guess, uh, Nick, I'm, I'm happy satisfied with letting the applicant work with staff to settle these, this particular issue, these two issues. Thanks, Roger. Uh, Rick DePerry? I am, um, I'm gonna say I concur with what you said earlier, and um, I'm okay with the parking, and I agree with your view on stormwater. And that's all I have. Thanks, Rick. All right, now I'm going to turn this over to any other questions or outstanding items, uh, free for all. Rachel, you want to go? Sure. There you go. Um, we received a letter from Representative Pingree, uh, and she had written to the Department of Veterans Affairs concerning some issues um, that actually impinge upon our regulations. Um, she indicated, um, I'll, I'll read the section of it. Among the concerns I have heard from veterans is that the co-location may deter veterans on account of their mental health status and trauma history from utilizing the vet center in the same complex as an ICE detention facility where persons, including youths, may be detained and visible in handcuffs or shackles during egress or may negatively affect the mental health of veterans who do not visit the vet center. I respectfully ask for questions to the answers to the following questions. Uh, and um, Joanne Boyle uh, from Veterans Affairs respond, responded, and in her letter she indicated in item number three, uh, ICE will not install signs or placards indicating that they occupy the building. Um, but in Scarborough, we actually ask for signs indicating who's occupying what where in terms of wayfaring and to identify entrances and exits of, from tenants. Um, so we have a, a contradiction um, that there will not be signs and we ask for signs. And if there are signs, the statement is from Representative Pingree that that will be a problem, that could be a problem for the mental health of veterans. Um, we also have ICE will use, uh, number four, ICE will use a separate sally port for entry and exit from the facility so that their presence will effect be effectively unnoticeable to veterans seeking treatment at the center. So I assume, uh, may, may I ask if all of the ICE staff will be going into the building through the fenced area to ensure that their presence is not visible? 
or that the presence of um, detainees is not visible? Yes. Yeah, were there others, Rachel, or was it those? Well, two? I'm just looking at, at those specifically from um, Representative Pingree. Yeah. Uh, I've got a couple of other things in addition. If I could just jump in on the signage thing. I, I don't believe our ordinance requires signs. It's just that if there are signs, they need to meet the site plan or meet the signage. We, we did uh, note at one point that um, ICE had proposed to put a sign on the door saying that it was the ICE facility. Um, so, and we have in the past asked for some sort of identification for where a tenant is when there is a multi-tenant building with different en entrances and exits. So that's what I was referring to. All right, so in other words, a question about signs for wayfaring or identification. Um, so that becomes a little bit of a, a contradiction. Uh, I took a look at the plans, and actually it's possible this might help you with your, um, with your flow process. Uh, and, on, and there's no... Oh, the last page of, of your application. It is the peak flow based on fixture count. And you've indicated in this that there are um, three showers in the, in the facility. And I looked at the plan and could only find two. Could you tell me where the three showers are? Because if there are only two, count. you have a different number of you have a different amount of water. Oh, do you want to take that um, one? I didn't know we had a flow rate issue with this, with uh, sanitary. No, no, no. That I think that's the thing. It's that is um that has nothing to do with stormwater. That's um water demand um, from the public okay. utility and the wastewater being generated. Uh, that was a document that was requested by Portland Water District because um, they do their metering based on peak flow. Uh, of water demand rather than the overall flow. So they wanted to get a fixture count. Um, we tried to give them a conservative uh, approach to that. Um, as Matt had indicated at the beginning of this meeting, there is a third tenant who is actively occupying the building. Um, and so we, we didn't, we haven't as the, the I, I personally haven't been in that space. So, um, so I couldn't you, tell you about that. You don't know, know if there are three showers? Yeah, I know how many showers you, there are, but I'm not sure what the, que the question is. Well, I'm forward. trying to, I, I, I saw that there were three showers. I looked at the plans, and I could only find two, and I've asked you where, <clears throat> where the third one is. I think I found two. Yeah. Um, I guess my question, the flow, I, I don't think it relates to our stormwater. Luckily, no, you, you're not. right. It doesn't, but it's still a question that I have. Sure. I can share the showers with you. Um, there are only there are only two. How does it, I can't see on this little cryptic plan here. Um, there are only two showers. One in each locker room. Okay. Um. Uh, Shelley Pingree's letter does indicate that there will be uh, potentially people, including youths, uh, detained, possibly, or visible in handcuffs uh, or shackles during egress. Um, that will not happen. There will be nobody staying overnight, and that will not happen after 5 o'clock. Is that correct? Is that what you said originally? Well, no one will be visible. Yeah, I mean, two things. I mean, the, there's the no one will be staying overnight. I think the bigger concern with Shelly Pingree's letter is we've got Shelly Pingree and then the VA answering, having this discussion, which is clearly in the context of Pingree being concerned about some policy issues. Sure. And the VA person is making representations about what the ICE people will want. And we think that largely th those kind of back and forth letters don't really help the board with any real information. So whether we need signs or not signs, um, you know, if it's not required, um, 
by uh, the town. If we're going to have some sort of signage, frankly, we disagree with the VA's response that the sign is going to somehow, or Shelley Pingree's statement that the sign is somehow going to have an adverse impact. We appreciate that there's a little bit of political football going there, um, but, um, but I'm not sure that's really good information for the planning board. So we are kind of interested in what the tenants need and what the town requires as far as signage. Um, all of the employees and, and folks visiting the ICE facility are going to be using the parking in the um, fenced-in area, which is at the full other end of the VA. But I think more importantly, we, we, that kind of correspondence really I don't think is relevant to what the planning board is looking at. We are able, if we need a sign, we can put in a sign. Um, there's no restriction on that, and um, we appreciate that uh, Congresswoman Pingree um, will continue to communicate on these kind of policy issues, but we think they're kind of outside what you folks are required to, to look at. And we're more interested in what, if anything, you need in order to feel like we're complying with all of your requirements. Well, I, in my personal opinion is that um, we do require, we do need uh, signs for wayfaring. Uh, signs so that somebody knows what that building that goes to, doors goes to in a multi-use building, where that door goes to, so that somebody, since they would be driving in in the immediate door that they see, would belong to the ICE. Um, they need to then to know if they're a veteran that they're going to be heading down the other way. Or so for they, UPS or FedEx or, UPA, or, or who, whoever it is, which is why I brought it up, because there was a contradiction uh, between what you folks had presented earlier on behalf of the GSA yeah. and what veterans was representing as their, I don't know whether it's their druthers, <laughs> uh, but the expression they use, ICE will not install, uh, which seemed pretty pretty firm yeah, and needed and, to be clarified. Well, we're, and again, we're, if the board, the sense of the board is for wayfaring and other purposes, you should have some discrete signage, we will do that. We, 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 we disagree with the VA statements, but more importantly, I, I think what folks appreciate is there's a little bit of back and forth here on politics between the Congresswoman office and the VA, and they're going to have to kind of sort out their issues, but um, uh, we don't think there's any problem with doing some kind of discrete signage to meet any requirements that the board may have, and we think the VA is, is entirely aware of the other tenants in this building and um, is excited to come on to this site, so um, setting aside kind of back and forth <laughs> responsive letters, with all due respect to the Congresswoman's, uh, Congresswoman's office, I, I think we're, we're able to do whatever the board requires. And with all due respect to um, the, the GSA, our, our pattern, when we get uh, letters from the public um, and they raise questions, uh, we, we read the letters. Uh, absolutely, and you should And, and we listen us. to them and we ask for explanations. Yes. And those are the questions. Those are some of the issues that yes. arose because of her letter. So that is, um, whether there's politics in back of it or not, we actually don't try not to ask neighbors uh, what's in their politics or relationship <laughs> with the neighbor next to them when they come and say something to us. Uh, and so it and is within our purview and actually is within the business of, of the planning board uh, absolutely. to address and, that. Absolutely, and all the information you have and all the questions, we want to make sure that we are answering them to the best of our ability. Um, and uh, I'm only trying to kind of make sure that the board is clear that on a specific issue of if we need a sign for purposes that, that the board thinks uh, are important, we will put in a sign, and we don't actually have any concerns about the VA objecting to that. So um, we, I just wanted to make sure that you know that we're here first and foremost to answer your questions and concerns, not, not others. So that's what we're trying to do. It is, uh, it is my opinion that we need a sign, whether my colleagues believe okay. or not. Is, we'll find out when we vote. Thanks. Thank you. And Rachel, like one, one more thing, there are three three showers, two in the men's, one in the women's. Uh, two in the? Two in the, in the men's uh, locker room and one in the women's. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Roger or Rick, do you have any other questions on this item or comments? 
This is Rick. I, I don't at this time. Thank you, Rick. Roger, anything? Not really. The only, the only thing um, per, pertaining to the sign, I think, is the way the traffic is directed into the site. Um, the, other, the other businesses are going to be around the corner. And th that's the only thing I can think of. I, I don't, you know, I'm not wedded to having a sign on the ice building, but I'm just thinking about the other businesses. They'll probably want to put a sign up there on their own just to make sure they're their customers know where they're located. That's all. Thanks, Roger. Uh, and uh, Mr. Chair, may I respond just for a moment? And, and that is uh, to remind the board that um, we just uh, dealt with the um, uh, self-storage and talked about the need for signs on buildings to direct people to uh, what building is where and you know where their units may be um, for varying purposes so we you know however it comes out um, it is within the normal review of the board to look at that thanks um, <clears throat> I don't want to I don't want to belabor the point either um, but I will I will also comment and just say uh, we've also approved buildings with not knowing it, what tenant would go in there and when and that is actually probably, in some of these cases, more par for the course. Um, and, and that's okay. I mean, I think uh, when I look at this, I see if somebody's making a poor decision if we're worried about uh, one group triggering another by, I mean, putting, you know, renting that space. And if it's not a suitable space for one of those two entities, they should be really seeking set some other space that works out. So I do feel like we're trying to place ourselves in the middle of what, you know, I don't know how what kind of relationship that's going to look like at the end of the day. Uh, but I don't know if that's my role in the planning board to solve that for them, whether or not people are, are getting triggered by seeing certain symbols. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what can set people off. I think it's probably a variety of things. So um, that's just my two cents. Uh, with that said, I do have a motion here and I will make the motion. Um, I move to approve the site plan amendment application titled GSA tenant fit out as depicted on the plan set prepared by WBRC dated 82420 with the following finders, waivers, and conditions. Findings, the applicant is proposing to renovate the existing building on the property for, for new tenants. The proposed renovations result in 11,490 square feet of non-municipal government use space and 4,510 square feet of professional office space. The property is located within an industrial I zoning district. Planning board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design of the site plan adequately addresses the site plan review and zoning ordinance requirements for site utilization and layout, access, internal vehicular movement, parking, pedestrian ways, landscaping, stormwater management, lighting, architecture, signage, utilities, and storage. In accordance with section 11B in the zoning ordinance, the planning board has determined that the proposed number of parking spaces is adequate given the needs analysis provided by the applicant. Two, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall revise the plan set to include A, additional plantings adjacent to the street corner as noted in the staff review memorandum dated 9-14-20. B, revise all stormwater management model to ensure that the flow rate for all storms is at or below pre-development conditions. C, additional pavement markings, arrows along the entirety of the drive aisle. D, a do not enter sign adjacent to the full access driveway for the site to ensure profit traffic flow throughout the site. E, a detail of the proposed light fixtures that include the proposed mounting height. F, a plan note indicating the specific time when the lights will be dimmed on the site. G, identification of the areas of non-municipal government use within the building. H, a detail of the wooden dumpster enclosure. I, the specific proposed conditions within the zoning matrix on the site layout plan. J, signage on the buildings identify the proposed tenant spaces. K, the standard site plan note. L, additional curbing along the northerly edge of the pavement area to direct more impervious area to the Filtera opening. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Three, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall A, pay the traffic impact fees, B, provide the approval from the Scarberry Sanitary District, C, provide approval from the Portland Water District, 
D, coordinate with the police department in regards to addressing from the renovated building. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Four, part of the issuance of a sign permit, the applicant shall provide his final signage plan. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Five, part of the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. That is the motion. I believe we addressed your signage concerns. Second. I have a second, Roger. <coughs> All right, any discussion? Okay, we'll call it. Roger Beely. Yes. Rick Duperry. Yes. Rachel Hendrickson. Yes. Nick McGee. Yes. Okay, congratulations. Good luck to you. you. Items 13, 14, and 15, uh, and 16 have been tabled, and hopefully we will see them uh, the next go around. Do a number 17 staff report. Uh, just a quick uh, report. I have a uh, de minimis change to a subdivision plan for Piper Shores. Uh, just a Scrivener's error um, from a prior approval from last year. If you guys could just sign that before you leave, that'd be great. That's all I have. Thanks, Jamel. Administrative amendment report. Uh, none at this time. A correspondence. Planning board comments. I've got one. You like, it was nice to be back, and it was <laughs> felt felt good to see people, <laughs> even through plexiglass. <laughs> but I think um, I think even just this little step, at least from my end, it felt a lot more smooth than maybe what it had been. And maybe that's a function of your chair, really just not liking Zoom. <laughs> uh, but I felt more comfortable. Rachel. Yeah, I I, I just have have a concern that I expressed to to Nick earlier that. Things are starting to stack up, um, and that gets worrisome uh, as it gets later, and it's time, you know, construction time starts to to head towards head towards winter. So I don't know if there's any way that we can find uh, an extra time to meet and at least get through the stack of those people who have some of whom may have been waiting for t through two board meetings. Um, and just clear out some of this backlog if it if it's possible and people are willing, then perhaps we could take a look at that because winter's close. As you know, it says Game of Thrones. Uh, winter is coming, mm. so um, it would be nice to to end the year uh, with a clean desk. That would be nice, uh, wouldn't it? <laughs> I will make mention uh, that. Council Chambers is actually not going to be available through the month of October due to voting and the separation um, that's needed. <laughs> so uh, we were able to sneak one hybrid meeting in, um, but we're going to, our next two are going to be fully remote. Sorry to say. This disappoints wow. the chair. I, I, I understand <laughs> that. And so I'm sorry to have to be the bearer of bad news after a long meeting. Uh, is it possible to use the um, community room over in the public safety building? Is that something that's available and wired? We've certainly been looking at all options. I think there's technological, um, certainly staff will continue to explore it is the best I can say. It gets a little trickier, especially trying to do the hybrid Zoom thing to have all the capacities that we need. Um, and yeah, staff will continue to advocate to try to find the best solution we can. Yeah, that, that's helpful because I think things do work better and easier when you can actually face people and talk to them and uh, it's smoother. Um, just seems to yeah. seems to go a little better. All right, any other planning board comments? Um, to Jamal, do you uh, require us to come in and sign anything? Uh, yeah, I was going to send you an email in the morning, but if you guys, planning board members on online here, if you could come and sign the plan, that would also be great. Thanks. All right. With that, I will make a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Roll call. Rachel Hendrickson. Yeah. yeah. Roger <laughs> Bealey. Yes. Rick Dupay. <laughs> and Nick McGee. Yes, absolutely. I show this as a unanimous vote. Good evening, and thank you all again. Over and out. Thank you. Thanks. Good job, Nick. <laughs>